got a quorum here so we can officially start our meeting and now we have one more than a quorum so we'll call the meeting to order for January 27 2020 if all the gentlemen here have seen the agenda um, if there's no changes or additions somebody could approve the agenda to get things started I make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. A second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Consent agenda items are the next thing on the list. Minutes from January 20th meeting. And it appears a liquor license for the Black Back Pub. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Make a motion to approve the consent agenda as written. Second. Second. Chris, I also have an outside consumption permit for Ty Smiley, which you approved last week, okay. but it was stapled to the license, so it didn't get signed. Ty, say that again? Ty Smiley. Ty Smiley, and you'd like that Smiley. under the same? Yeah, it's just, it was approved. It was a you already approved, approved it. She just approved wants it. you to sign it. Okay, all right. All right. So, no addition to the consent agenda. We've had a motion made and seconded. All those in favor of approving that agenda, please say aye. 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 Public. Uh, now it's time for public to speak. If there's anybody here who wishes to do so. Uh, seeing none, we can scratch that off our list and move right into the Library Commissioner's budget report. If you'd like to come up. Dan. Sorry, Dan. Say that. Uh, this year's budget ends in the same place as last year's budget. We're able to get to the same number, 484, 430. Um, so 0% increase. Um, 0 percent increase in the taxes necessary to run the budget, right, Dan? Yeah, thank you. Um, the budget funds. Library that is continuing to see more people circulate more items and um, see things like computer use go up as well. The handout I passed out to you um, that Almy put together. Thank you. And thanks to Bill and Almy for putting the budget together as well. Um, the commissioners have, you know, reviewed the budget over the last two meetings. Um, but Bill and Almy really um, did the lion's share. And hang on, Dan. Ann, can you hear them? No. Okay, they so the let's take the mic from the. No, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't cover it up. So let's take this mic over here and give that to them. I was wondering there if. Oh, she got one. Sorry about that. Yeah, no I was kind of wondering. Uh, so, in terms of uh, numbers going up, um, the handout that we distributed just now, we have an increase of 12,575 visits. That's folks coming through our door, 20, which represents a 22% change, 22.3. Circulation. Um, that includes books, media, other items checked out, um, 5,886, 14.3% increase. Um, we have more people coming to our adult programs, more people coming to our youth programs, and more people using the computers. Um, so we feel like given the um, increased usage, being able to fund that again with the same number that we asked taxpayers for last year. Um, 
feels like a pretty good thing. Yeah, I'm I'm tickled right to death that uh, you were able to level fund your budget this year. Um, it's it means a lot. Uh, kudos to to all of you for for doing a great job. Um, I wish we could say the same <laughs> on the other parts of the uh, budgets, but the fact that uh, that you were able to do what you did is huge. Yeah, um, th thanks again to Bill and Almy for helping us get there. Yeah. yeah. What do you contri um, contribute to the large amount of uh, visits? That's a pretty big amount of large amount of visits that's increased. Is there anything in particular that may have done that? Do you want to take a first stab at that, Almy? Sure. I don't think there's any one thing. I think it's a combination of factors. Um, I think that uh, more, you know, more people are coming in because of the new building still. Uh, I think we've, we've definitely increased the kinds of services that we've provided in the last year and a half or so, and we've increased the outreach to the community to let people know what is at the library, and people are hearing about that, and so then they're coming in. Um, sometimes they come in for one specific thing, like, oh, I heard you have snowshoes, or I heard I can get digital books through you guys. Is that true? Uh, and then sometimes it's just that they're hearing the buzz about the library services, and they feel like they should go check it out. So um, I think it's, it's a lot of different things. I can say that. I've, I've come more, because I think you have better and more interesting programs than you ever have. Yeah, our programs have definitely... Um, definitely draw in a lot of people. They might come for a program and then they might say, oh, there's a lot of stuff here. I'll, I'll get a card. So, right. yeah. Because in this day and age, with the internet, a lot of people like myself don't use the library nearly as much as they did in the past, but I think the programs are what gets people there. And to use yeah, I agree. Service. That's a big part of it too, yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Thanks. Do you want to just you talk about the internet. Um, I think one of the things personally I use more, and I'm recommending to a lot of people, <clears throat> are the internet services that we have through the library. The, I, I do a lot of audio books, and it's great how much you can do through the library, but still just downloading to your phone or your computer, what have you. So I think the Almy and the staff has done a great, have done a great job of really improving the services and uh, broadening the reach to uh, the community to what people need because things change, and I think they're changing along with it. I'll just add one other thing to that, and that's um, I know last year we did um, have an increase um, in our budget, and that has, I think, helped us um, in terms of getting the word out, in terms of doing that outreach. That was one of the goals of last year's increase, was to increase our outreach. Um, so I think you're seeing the dividends of that paying off as well. It's also the library is much more inviting place to come to than it ever has been. You know, it used to be. You know, I'm not saying it was terrible before, but you know, it just didn't. You know, it, it just like you could go and read or do whatever. You know, but I think the programs are what's you know driving, you know, you know your success. Yeah, I think the space is very inviting too. You have little meeting rooms and um, big meeting room. Um, she needs to get maxed out, so um, the old library was, was very um, cramped. <laughs> yeah, the meeting rooms are incredibly popular. Almy can probably speak to that better than I. So moving forward into next year, um, have you thought at all or talked at all about whether you're going to restructure any changes in fees or bring on any new programs that will add additional fees, or have you gotten that far yet? It's Do you want to talk about the non-resident fee? Sure. Yeah. Um, so you know we don't uh, we don't charge a lot of fees because taxpayers have paid once. We're not going to charge them again, um, and. Uh, we did have an increase in non-resident fees this year. Yeah, I see that. Went up. And not just when I say increase, I don't just mean it went up in the budget, but we raised the cost of a non-resident fee. Um, and that's the first time I can remember that's happened. 
uh, we were not in line with other libraries. We did uh, a survey, well, informally asked around what other libraries were um, charging for their non-resident fees, and we were well below it. So uh, non-resident fees did go up. Um, That's funny because somebody, uh, resident, just mentioned that to me the other day, uh, that how little uh, we were charging for non-resident fees. And so I'm, I'm happy to see that, that you considered putting them up just a little bit. What do you, what do you charge? We were at 20. 10. Oh, 10, and we went up to 25. 25. Yeah. Starting an annual, first. like a library card for a year or something? For a non-resident, yes. Yeah. Adult. Yeah, a non-resident adult. Children still have access through the schools. The schools come and bring kids. So if a kid's from Duxbury and comes over here on a class trip, they can still get a card. Chris? Sure. So I don't want to throw cold water on the fact that you know the budget is coming in with the same tax um, levy as last year. Um, but I, I do need to point a couple things out because I, I don't want to be here a year from now and say, oh, what happened? So if you look at the actual column, if you look at the revenues, you see this, we budgeted $503,530 and we took in $510,000. And the, and the difference mainly is uh, three or four lines up from that, donations. We don't budget for donations. There were almost uh, $5,900 worth of donations made to the library. And then down at the bottom of the page, you see the total expenditures were almost exactly what we budgeted, 487651 But again, if you go up a couple lines from there, there was purchases by donations of 5871 So those, the increase of the revenue and, and what was purchased by the donations cancel each other out. So the, the, frankly, the library spent only about $581,000 or $582,000 of its own money last year. So that's where the $6,200 fund balance comes in. That is at the bottom there in the actual column. And the reason why they were underspent by that much money was if you go up to the health insurance line, Partway through the year, one of the employees had a family a situation change in the family, and they went from a two-family, a two-person plan to a one-person plan. So we saved, you know, four thousand, three or four thousand dollars there. If you look at the regular pay line, you see between the regular pay and the part-time pay, we spent just about exactly what we had planned to spend last year. But if you go over to 2020, you see there's a fairly significant increase in the, in the uh, pay. Um, that would be $208,000 just simply because of the fact that the new staff person that they added last year came on in June. This year it's a full year's worth of a new staff person. So that gets you up to 208. And then it's 211,445 because there's one staff person this year that they're hoping to add four hours to. So we're coming out with um, a $484,433 tax levy, which is exactly the same as last year. It's a good thing. They were able to do that, still transferring a little bit less from the trust than they did last year. But Going forward, you know, if we spend exactly what we have on the page, you know, it's, it's a 4.5% increase in terms of the budget. The spending is up 4.5%. Uh, it's because we had some fortunate things happen last year. And, you know, we've got the trust. And fortunately, we didn't have to, you know, transfer $30,000 over just to keep the... Uh, tax is the same. So it's good news, and I told the commissioners that going into the process that if we could have a goal of keeping the taxes the same this year, that would be a win. So I, it, it is a win, and I think they did a good job with it, but I, I just don't want to come back a year from now, and if it requires an increase of 5%, you'll understand a little bit why. So. 
I just want you to be have the full picture. That's all. Well, that's I kind of guess that's why I asked if there were any changes that might be able to increase the revenue source in some manner uh, because it's only uh, it's only uh, too good to be true once in a while. Uh, it never stays like that. So I, it, you know, not being able, I've gone through most of it real quick here, the budget line items and, and the uh, expenditures and revenues, but uh, to pick up on those points that you just mentioned would have taken me a bit longer. Uh, but overall, I know better than to think that, you know, year to year we can stay uh, <clears throat> Stay right on target with the same prior budget. Uh, never usually lasts more than one year, so I guess that's why well, I was inquiring as to whether or not we might see other revenue sources. I think when you look at the growth of their programs and circulation and attendance and everything else, it's clearly an investment that's that's worth making. That health insurance line alone, the change happened. Uh, partway through 2019, so instead of spending 26,000, we only spent about 23,000. But that change carries through to 2020, and it's only about 19,000 this year. So there's still, you know, about a $5,000 difference between this year's health insurance line and last year's, just because of that one change. And that's a line that can change like that. We know, you know it's if somebody. Uh, if somebody leaves and you hire somebody new and somebody who's not taking insurance now and the new person you hire takes it, it can make a big difference. But overall, I think it's a, it's a very defensible budget. I think they've done a good job with it. And uh, we'll worry about next year next year. But I just wanted to make sure you had a full picture. Bill, what's the balance of the trust fund? And is there an annual cap that, we, that can be taken as revenue? So um, the trust fund, um, it's about 500000 I think. Uh, I think around that, slightly under, maybe. Yeah. So uh, the commissioners have a, a formula. Uh, they've, they've talked about uh, what they should transfer on a, you know, should they um, change the formula to like the town did last year. But I think it's... While even the formula that they had in place historically would have allowed them to transfer more this year, the fact that we could keep the taxes level with only a $14,000 transfer, it doesn't make sense to right. take money out of, the, out of the trust fund just to get a, a one-year savings. Let that money grow. And a, a year from now, if they need it, because things didn't come out as rosy, and it works into the formula that they have, maybe they can transfer a little bit more. But it doesn't make sense to do it this year. Now I'm thinking if they have like a, a big project, they want to purchase something, that would be a, ton, a year that we might want to take more out of that trust fund. Is, is that your formula? No. Um, no, the formula more um, uh, speaks to how the trust fund performs. So if it un underperforms one year, then um, nothing is distributed. And if it performs up to a certain level, I want to say 3%, um, then I'm trying to remember the exact formula. It's but going to get 3% three before percent. anything can transfer. Right, right. And then the next 3% goes to the town. So there, the formula more speaks to the performance of the trust fund and how it gets distributed. The capital. Yeah. I'm going to throw a hypothetical question at you and, and see what your answer is. Uh, if in a case like this last year or current performance of the stock market, excluding today's performance, um, in a trust similar to theirs does incredibly well with our inability to predict what the future markets will do, does it, would it make sense, I mean, if I were in their boat in a private investment type thing and had the same scenario dealing with a budget like this, I'd be tempted to 
borrow more, put it towards the budget, end up with a possible surplus going into next year, uh, knowing that a year from now, if the markets underperform, you've got a cushion built into your current budget that'll carry you through and, and help out for next year. Yeah, and if, in fact, next year rolls around and the market's still doing incredibly well, you don't have to t touch a thing because you've moved forward with a, a, a fund surplus that will serve the purpose that you need it to serve. That's, yeah, that's no, how I, I understand that. And, you know, the library commissioners uh, are the trustees of the trust fund. So they're the ones that make the decision. I think they've been very thoughtful over time. They've been very uh, willing to, you know, listen to suggestions and we, we work collaboratively on it. I think that, you know, one of the things that I talked about with them was, you know, the, the, the market did very well this year, it did well last year. It might be a time to, you know, take some uh, of the earnings off the top, rebalance the portfolio a little bit. Um, <clears throat> You know, moving it over here, um, there's, you know, that, that's an interesting idea that you have, that if you, you know, put $25,000 here as opposed to fourteen, but left the taxes exactly at the four eighty four, yeah. and you end up with a surplus next year. But the, the problem with that is that if, the, if something happens in a year and your budget kind of goes haywire, You've eaten up that surplus, and and it's gone. So um, something that it's really them you need to be talking about. No, and I'm not trying to convince you how to handle your money. I was just throwing out a, a another option, viable option. Uh, and to your point, if their budget goes haywire, they're covered uh, because the money would have to come from, from somewhere. So it's just another option to think about uh, because. Uh, as I suggested at one of our last previous meetings, you know, I can't believe we're going to keep continuing with a bull market here. Um, at some point, we'd have to believe, based on our past history, that the economy uh, might start to decline a little bit. So it's just it's a it's a roll of the dice. Like I said, nobody has the crystal ball. Uh, but if I was doing exceptionally well in a specific market, I might use that to my advantage in a scenario like yours. Yeah, we, as Bill mentioned, um, we are planning to meet um, in, at some point with our uh, folks from um, Morgan, Stanley. Morgan Stanley. Yeah, I always say Merrill Lynch. Uh, with Morgan Stanley to have, have us come and give us a little advice about that. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, you guys have total control of your budget and your money. So, if you were to do something like that, it's not like it's going to be taken out of your hands from some other part of the municipality. That just don't happen. Uh, so you wouldn't you wouldn't be in fear of losing that to one of the other departments. So just something to keep in mind. That's all. That's all. There's always different ways to skin a cat, uh, and we have to we have to try to protect ourselves. So. Other than that, everything looks great. Uh, appreciate the job you guys have all done over the last year and keep up the good work. Thank you. I have a question. It's a tiny detail, but the donations, are these just um, cash donations? Do you have some fundraising that you do? That, where is it? And do you kind of earmark what the $6,000 plus or minus is going to go to? Um, Bill, maybe you can help me on this a little bit. Some of the donations are <clears throat> people paying for lost books. Um, for We have an adopt an author um, program where people pay us to make sure we have the, the particular author's new books all, on the shelf all the time. So some of it's that. Um, some of it, I think grants are in a separate line, is that correct? Yeah, it's not, they're not grants. Yeah. Um, some of it is... Uh, People, people give us more than they owe us 
for whatever, a cup of coffee or a book. They round up. They round up or, yeah. Does um, some of it come from the friends? Um, I can't remember if the friends goes into donations or grants. I think it depends on what they're giving it to us for. Yeah. Um, anyway, when the, when the donations come in, Jane, uh, what has been the practice for a long time is that people don't typically make donations to reduce somebody else's taxes in a given year. So the donations come in and uh, you, you see that the, the amount of money that was spent for donations matches or almost yeah. exactly matches what came in. So, so the library, uh, when those kind of nominal donations come in like that, they just use that to augment their budget. They do a little bit more. Um, if they get a bigger donation, um, maybe one that's earmarked, but not for something specific right now, there's a, a separate fund, and we'll, we'll look at that uh, uh, a little later. But the library has three funds associated with it. There's the operating fund, which is 13. There's a different donation fund that's for more earmarked things. Um, and then there's the fund 16, which is the trust. And um, the commissioners, if they wanted to do something big with that fund 16, they would move the money to the operating fund and buy it because we've always, when I worked with the former commissioners before they were fully public, was that, you know, this is, this is the public's library and they should see everything. You shouldn't have kind of a slush fund that's hidden over here and you're buying things out of it. The public ought to know what it costs to run the library. Mm -hmm. So everything gets purchased out of the operating okay. fund. I can give you a couple of other examples of donations. Um, sometimes checks just show up in the mail. Somebody was feeling generous. Yeah, didn't you have a woman who said it was a couple of years ago? So yeah. <laughs> so this year I think we got a $500 donation just out of the blue, no strings attached, and we could decide what we wanted to spend it on. We got another one for 100 that was two others for 100 that were similar. Um, and. Some of the things that we've done with those, um, the one project I'm working on right now is getting another sign for, if you walk outside the our front door, there's that wall um, that's just a clabbered wall as you walk in. Um, and we've noticed that when you drive, you can, there's a sign out on the road, but then when you drive up, it's not always really clear to people who haven't yeah. been here before which door is the library. Okay. So we're getting a sign made from a local company in Morrisville to put a sign on that wall so when people drive that way they Did see, oh, there's, the there's library. Yet to make sure we can put it on the I talked to Woody. Well, we better talk to the zoning okay. so we'll sure we <laughs> Well, I haven't bought it yet, so <laughs> we still have time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's good information. I have a quick question on the, um, the large gro growth in youth programs, but you're the attendance for youth programs doesn't seem to be growing at the same rate. And I was just wondering maybe if you could just explain that a little bit, if you could. Because I, I guess my quick math says that like three youth attend each program if you just divide attendance versus number of programs. So I was kind of trying to understand what these programs are, how, much, how many kids attend, and why the two aren't growing almost at the even a close rate. So 2,500 right. attendees, Mark? In oh, sorry, so it's 30, yep. It's, so it's 241 is, is the growth so number. Okay. I see. No, but I see, no, I, I noticed that too, that the number of programs um, increase doesn't really match the attendance growth in a, as far as um, percentages. Um, I think part of it is that we have tried a lot of new things this year in the youth, and you can see that be, by the number of programs that we offered, we've started offering programs during school breaks, um, and those have not been well attended, um, but we aren't quite ready to give up on offering them yet. We think maybe people will start realizing that they're there and coming in for them. Um, we've also noticed, as I think a lot of libraries around the state, if not the country, have noticed that well, in Vermont, as you know, there was a few years ago, there's the, um, the preschool expansion 
for uh, families. And m most Vermont libraries saw a pretty significant drop in uh, story time attendance at that point. We're still offering two story times. We've discussed going to one, um, but we're not quite ready to take that plunge yet either. Um, I know, I can tell you that our after school programs are very well attended. Those are usually full and sometimes even with a waiting list. So um, I think some of it has to do with just that we're trying new things and some of them haven't caught on yet. Is the preschool, when you say go from two to one, would that be, is, is that once a month? Or? No, it's every week. So right now we have, I'm sorry, twice a week. You have and One is sort of targeted towards the younger group and one is targeted towards a slightly older group. Mm -hmm. um, and those numbers are usually pretty small. So we've thought about combining them, but we haven't done that yet. I think you're to be commended for the effort and um, it's paying off in the increased um, visits. The, the, the library has a good feel to it. It's inviting. Glad you think so. It's very inviting, as are all your, your events. So thanks for all your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, guys, all for your Thank hard you. work. Thank you. I'll let you go home. Good. All right. So the next thing on our agenda is discuss the State of Vermont Aquatic Nuisance Control Greeter Grant on behalf of Friends of Waterbury Reservoir. Yep. So Chuck Becker is here from the Friends. And you can go right up there, Chuck. Come on up and chew our ear. Um, so I've just distributed the uh, the application for the Vermont Aquatic Nuisance Control Grant and Aid Program for 2020. Um, it's a 25%. Uh, the grant would pay 25% of the program cost. So if you flipped over to the third page, the program cost is uh, $8,613. And 25% uh, of that is a grant of 21.53. Um, the, the library funds, uh, I mean the uh, planning budget, has uh, a $2,500 uh, grant um, in the in the uh, line item in a $2,500 expense. And as we said when Steve was here, it's in and out as far as we're concerned. Whatever amount comes in will go out. Um, the friends make up the difference, the, uh, the remaining money that is above the grant amount. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chuck and you can describe the program and anything else you want to say. Sure. Well, we started in uh, 2016 with one greeter uh, focusing on the Blush Hill uh, access point. And then two years ago, we were able to hire a second greeter. And it's for one weekend day. Uh, usually a Saturday, unless the weather's shitty, then they come. Sorry, uh, then they come <coughs> on a Sunday. Uh, and then last year we had like 600 boat interactions, uh, 350 at Blush Hill and 250 at the dam site. And this is again a course of one weekend day. And uh, you know, they're there to educate, agree to educate uh, about the, the invasive species. Waterbury is really unique because we have a, a reservoir that that doesn't have boat owners on it, really homeowners on it. Everybody comes in with the trailers from all over the place, and we have like basically three access points. So the, uh, it really is, is very, and it's a large lake, so it's, it's attractive for people to come to it. So it's sort of, you know, at risk for all sorts of invasive species. So it's a, the state sees it as a priority. They sort of pushed us four years ago to, to start doing it. Um, so uh, we want to continue with the same level of staffing. We try to we didn't have enough money to increase it. They do two days a week, two weekend days. Um, and we'll see what happens. I don't know. The 20, 25% is not guaranteed because the numbers keep going up of the groups applying. So that number and, and the funds are staying steady as I understand it. So the percentage could come, come down as well. And that may have to adjust what we can do. You would think with all the uh, concern about climate change and those types of things that they would at least increase that 
fund uh, to reflect the, the growing risk. You, I think they get like, I think 30%, so they have the boat registration fees. That's where the money comes from. And so that is not, not like a state appropriation. So depending on what comes in, they get that. Um, is there any indication, maybe outside of the kind of the line of what you're discussing here, but any indication about uh, a worry of uh, uh, algae blooms or phosphorus? No, no. Yeah. We have the brittle they, naiad. They contribute to uh, Yeah, we have brittle naiad that is, you know, blooms. It wasn't too bad last year, but it's uh, the, the really terrible one is a uh, Eurasian milfoil. You know, like bomazine, and it really, it it really screws up the, the uh, bathing and swimming, uh, and we don't have that. It's not found yet in the Water Bay Reservoir. The, the invasives you have are, are uh, land-based plants, right? Uh, no, the the, the well, uh, they're not like the uh, the Ra Eurasian milfoil starts growing from the bottom of the lake. Right. right. I mean, it's supposed to float any kind of stuff. Yeah. And right. The brittle naiad and the Japanese knotweed and stuff like that oh. is basically around the perimeter of the lake. Yeah, the knotweed, that's not, I mean, this is aquatic invasives. I mean, the, the knotweed is taking over. That's a whole other issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Mike, you must have some kind of an idea of different types of invasives that. I have loads of experience yeah. with invasives. Um, with the various uh, water based groups I've been involved with. Milfoil is really the big one. The second one probably is zebra mussels. Uh, and I know fishermen and boaters really have been spoken to about washing their, their trailers off because that's where it all spreads is via hitchhikers, you know, on trailers. And, it, and people don't realize you really have to your live wells and stuff like that, you have to flush that out because that's another place that um, all the invasives will, will hitchhike. And I think the greeters do a good job. I know I have seen, because I fish a lot of places throughout Vermont, they do a good job. One thing I could say, a couple of years ago, I don't think you've had that greeter maybe again, but, or maybe he was just there one time. He wasn't the most friendly sort. And, and that's a really important thing because at our, our accesses, we want people to be friendly, to bring business back to this area. And if you have someone who's acting like a fish cop, you know, it, 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 it's, it's not a good experience. Mm -hmm. And this individual, you know, I, I tried to say, I've been involved in Lake Champlain Walleye Association presence. I know exactly what you're doing. I say, I clean my boat. I say, I'm not the person that you have to worry about. And he gave me a little bit of the ninth degree. Mm -hmm. And I was a little bit concerned with someone like me who knows about how bad invasives can be. But I think the only thing that we have going for us in the reservoir, because it's so deep and milfoil, Problem, you know, it's only going to be in the very shallow reaches that milfoil is going to attach. So that may help us a little bit with, with invasions. I would be more concerned about zebra mussels, and zebra mussels are much harder to prevent from moving. So, you think the way the lake structured, being pretty much limited with shallow areas that uh, in the freshwater input probably helps keep that up. helps I think also on zebra mussels because they're relatively shallow water um, growers. Yeah, yeah growers yeah but we don't have any zebra mussels right no no that's right no but it is a real concern in Champlain that was a huge concern not only it was a big concern for like water plants you know they were concerned about water plants the intakes getting clogged and stuff like that but most of the stations, it's really, it's a milfoil kind of protection. Do we have um, Didymo here? That's, no. Yeah, that's Rock Snot. Didymo Spania, it's called Rock Snot. Rock Snot. Uh, it's easy it's not really an invasive, <laughs> that's... They determined that natural. And as a matter of fact, they got, they got rid of, they used to have where you weren't able to use felt 
waiters because they felt you you transferred right. the rock snot uh, to different bodies, and they went away from that because they determined Didymo is natural. It's naturally it's a native. Yeah. So, Chuck, this greeter program, um, is it purely educational and just passing on information, or are there people there from, like, forest parks checking boats and things, things like that? I mean, is there any enforcement part of it? No, and we're not allowed. We do offer uh, inspections. And we okay. let people know now, by state law, the boats, you know, they have to, what needs to be done in terms of cleaning the boat. And then the greeters will offer, well, I'll take a look around and empty out. We have sponges, they empty out the dry wells. But it's all voluntary on the boaters' part. And we've been you know, fairly lucky. That's right. At Blush Hill, I thought we'd have a lot of problems. And it's like once or twice during the season, someone really is difficult. But most but, often, you know, and agree there's no one to back off. I can somebody. just imagine somebody who's been waiting on Blush Hill in a line of 19 boats oh. to get in, and they just want to go out and go fishing or go skiing or whatever. They, they might get a little hot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But we, we collect the data, at least get the information we have from, Bay. and give them some yeah. information, and uh, do the best you can. Really. Yeah, I was going to ask you if, if anybody had ever been turned away. For no, no, we can't do that. No. Yeah. So it doesn't, you don't do this greeting at the um, Waterbury Center State Park? No, no. Is that because too many people, or you don't have enough staff? We don't have the staff. I mean, yeah. this is really where, when we started doing this, we were really concerned, again, about the Blush Hill, not knowing what's going on there. Right. You know, that was the Wild West. And then, uh, and, and also the state part, I mean, the take use, it's crowded. And yeah. my personal feeling is that the state should be doing more of that as part of a park. Uh, but, you know, that the, makes sense. It has been talked about doing some sort of uh, some collaboration. Yeah. And we went over there once, I think, uh, one Saturday, three years ago. But it just it didn't work out as well. We didn't get the numbers that we thought we would. And we really decided just to focus on what we think the big need is. Okay. More of the trailer-based activity is really either the dam or Blush Hill, not not the state Yeah, I think you see more canoes, kayaks, and stuff there. But you still see some boats. But there's just a limited amount of parking space there for boats. So I don't think the boaters are going. Yeah, I've been told that uh, there's days, certain days during the summer when that. Lake is just pretty much inaccessible. Yeah. Yeah, over, overwhelmed with people. You get Blush Hill. It's really nice what the state has done to improve the access, but there used to be sometimes if you go on a summer day, they will way up that access road, the, the trailers. It was very difficult. And sometimes you'd have to wait half hour to put in. Yeah, then you get some knucklehead hung up in the ditch with the boat out and the trailer out in the middle of the road, and <laughs> things get really interesting. Chuck, it's a good, it's a really good and well worth worthwhile project. Thank you, Thank you for you know, going. So you're looking for a motion to yeah, approve this? Yeah, we should uh, make a motion to authorize us to uh, apply for the grant and authorize me to sign it if it's necessary. I think it is. I'll make a motion to authorize um, going forward with the grant, and Bill would sign it. I'll second, second. it. And I, I think it's a tremendous value for the small amount of money here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate what you do there, Chuck. So we got a motion and a tie for a second. So <laughs> all those in favor that wish to approve this motion, please say aye. 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 Thanks, Thanks Chuck. again, Chuck, Thank for coming you. in. Good luck. Good luck uh, this year. Bill, I was going to ask, um, I think maybe last meeting you mentioned that the draining of the reservoir is going to come to an end seasonally. Is that actually helping us on so the battle some of this? So the speculation that the fact that they draw the reservoir down and expose a certain level of the shoreline to freezing temperatures, that that may be helpful to keeping some of the invasives no, out. And, um, you know, when they fix their tainter gates, the new uh, license that Green Mountain Power has, and the, the, so the, uh, the pool will be kept at the summer pool level, which means there will not be a drop of, I think it's like, 30 feet or something like that difference 
Okay. And there's some, uh, you know, when you're in the shallow areas, you can really see there's a long way you walk out before you hit the water. So when, when the dam is finally fixed, they're not going to lower and raise the level of the water anymore. And that might, the concern is, might make it more attractive to milfoil. Yes. Um, but I think it's still going to be a number of years before the federal government ponies up the money to do the work. I mean, it's a, uh, I don't know, $100 billion project or something like that. So. Well, maybe there'll be somebody around at that point that will remind them of that scenario and uh, keep a steady eye on it. And if they see any indication of it at all, of course, by that time point, if they go through all these efforts to change that, to be able to go back to lowering that only for the simple fact of killing those invasives before they get too much of a strong foothold, might be something they might want to consider yeah, I mean, if that's it's, possible. It, it's, it's a double-edged sword, though, because um, 25 years ago, or more maybe, and maybe you remember, but you know the, the state tried to make uh, the reservoir a trophy trout area where they were expecting the rainbow trout might get to be you know, two feet long. Uh, and the trout just don't grow to the degree that they think they should. And uh, the biologists also have done research and speculate a little bit, but they think that the, the up and down of the water is detrimental to the water quality because it is conducive to erosion. You've got these, uh, you know, bare banks in the springtime and it rains and the snow melt and a lot of silt gets washed in there. So they're thinking that the trout don't grow as big as they would if, if you didn't do that. So wh who knows? Yeah. What's going to be more of a problem is, I think, and this is Chuck's program is not going to do anything about it, is like knotweed along the shorelines because knotweed's becoming a problem everywhere. And I remember when I was chair of the uh, Conservation Commission, when the reservoir was drained down, we did a cutting project to cut, you know, some of the knotweed was establishing because we didn't want it to, when it filled back up, you know, we, just, we didn't want to have it to have roots there. Uh, that's going to be Chuck a problem. Chuck and I were on that detail too. Yeah. <laughs> do you yeah, think both any, of you. Do you think any of that landslide um, material that's gone in there is going to have any repercussions? It can. Because that's a lot of material that went in there. Yeah. The state geologist right now, I went to the program up at the Green Mountain Club a couple weeks ago. She indicates it looks like most of the silt is washing right through and going right out um, to the Winooski and will ultimately, you know, silt up like Champlain. <laughs> but uh, it, it certainly has been detrimental to the water quality. I know the, the northern arm or the western arm, whatever you want to call it, was quite uh, turbid all of last year. And the Little River was really turbid all year long. So, well, I remember when they were reconstructing the dam here not too long ago, and they drained the, the lake down. At one point, I was on the uh, Waterbury Center side, and I was looking at the bottom of the lake, and I said, what a perfect time, because there was a huge gravel deposit there. What a perfect time to go in there and extract some of that material out of the lake, deepening the lake, uh, and probably benefiting it by making it deeper um, and having that aggregate source for, for whatever use. Uh, and maybe in the future, if it comes to a point where they have to drain that down again and there are ind indications of silt areas that have filled in, maybe they could that out, but that's, uh, who knows if that'll ever come about, so. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Chuck. thanks, Chuck. Yeah, sometimes common sense doesn't Good register. luck, Chuck. If you ever need a greeter, I might be able to help. Okay, on to the manager's items, which are pretty much the budget. Yeah, so, um, I hope that the information I sent out on Saturday night um, kind of speaks for itself. Um, 
just briefly, because I view this now really as, as your meeting. I, I'll answer questions, but I'm not going to try to convince the board of anything. Um, two of you weren't here last week, and there was, uh, you know, what I did a week ago was present the three operating funds, uh, including the library budget, and, and showed that the three operating funds, as they were built last week, uh, had a 51 cent tax rate which was no increase over the previous year. And back in December, that was a goal that you asked me to get to. And, you know, I, I did that. I worked on that for a couple of weeks in the back of my mind, wondering what would be the situation when we looked at the, the capital funds. And I knew that we built the capital funds a year ago so that if everything happened exactly according to Hoyle, according to last year's budget, that would end 19 with about $30,000 in the bank. And you know that we had fire trucks. Um, we bought one last year. Um, we didn't borrow for it because we had cash and waiting to borrow until 2020. We'll put the payment, the first payment off until 2021, so it won't impact this year's tax rate. But anyway, um, I came up with a capital budget last week that was in deficit by about two hundred and sixty or two hundred and eighty thousand dollars, and I said, you know, in order to uh, end the year with zero in the bank, you need about a four cent tax increase to uh, to accomplish that, or you have to borrow, or you can do a combination of the two, and. Chris and Mark had a dialogue, and uh, my takeaway from that was that I should try to come back with a budget <clears throat> that maybe kind of, you know, split that down the middle to a degree. So the first thing that I did without, and I, I tried to do it independently so I, I wouldn't be influenced one way or the other, I said, well, um, let's just add three cents to the tax rate. So we'd go from 51 to 54 cents. And since our operating funds are where all the transfers into the CIP come from, I said three cents multiplied three by $7.6 million, which is our grand list, and came up with a number, uh, $229,340, that could be put in the aggregate into all the transfer from the operating funds to the CIP funds. So that was the first thing that I did. And then without looking at what that was going to do to the CIP, I knew it was going to add $230,000, but without looking at all the different bottom lines in those CIPs, then I went through and I tried to identify borrowing that could be done, things that would be reasonable to borrow for. As I said in the memo, um, even though we kind of have a CIP fund that we use in the aggregate. I didn't borrow for any paving funds because there was some kind of disagreement as to whether we should be borrowing for things that are rather temporal, you know, seven-year lives that you have to just do the whole thing over again. So the borrowing I targeted was for, for infrastructure and for vehicle purchases. And clearly we already had authority from last year and I, I said, okay, we had authority to borrow $950,000 for fire trucks. We had authority to borrow $125,000 for the roadside mower. Uh, and then I went through and I said, well, okay, we're going to do a roof on the highway garage. Maybe we should borrow for that. We're going to do a roof on the uh, uh, bathhouse garage. Maybe we should borrow for that. <clears throat> We're going to do a $170,000 bridge project. Maybe we should borrow for that. So I identified places that we could borrow. And then, again, taking a page from the discussion that um, we've had in the past, they said, well, rather than borrow $950,000 for the fire trucks, they're going to last 20 years, why don't I take the fire truck $950,000 borrowing authority, divide that by 20 years, and then subtract one year from that, in essence, paying cash for the first year. 
So for the fire trucks, instead of borrowing 950,000, I show borrowing uh, $902,500. <coughs> and I did that for other, uh, other borrowing in there. For the, for the roadside mower, um, we have authority to borrow 125, but the mower is only gonna cost 116.8, so you really can't borrow for more than, you, than your purchase price is gonna be. So I took the 116.8 and I divided that by 20 years uh, because Celia said the tractor portion of that anyway should last 20 years given how we'll use it um, and, and borrow 110. And I did that for all the borrowing, so I kind of discounted the amount to, to borrow. And then I ident identified the length of time and I uh, came up with, um, you know, somewhere in the 15 to 18 year range in the, in the aggregate. So anyway, that's what I did. And if we borrowed what I identified, and if we raised three cents, we would end up in the CIP funds with um, about $268,000 in the bank at the end of 2020, um, if everything else came out exactly as uh, planned. And $268,000 in the bank is a whole lot more than the $30,000 that we anticipated ending 2019 in. So I said, okay, that's, that's kind of a good thing. And now here's where you folks come into play. Um, if you want to keep the tax rate a little bit more manageable, um, if you only raise two cents instead of three cents, you're going to raise, um, you know, $150,000 instead of $230,000. <coughs> um, if you want to borrow a little bit less, you can do that. So it's really, it's really kind of your choice as to uh, which way you want to go. Um, I'm going to pass this out. This is uh, an update to the borrowing chart that I passed out at the meeting we had in November when we were buying the fire trucks. I don't want to talk about this now, but I just want you to have it. I'll stop there and let you kind of ask questions about where we are at this point based on what I just said about the memo and what I sent out on Saturday night. So I'll let you folks kind of take it from there. I guess my first question is, uh, does everybody understand what, what Bill just explained? It's uh, a lot to get wrap your arms around. Um, so if you've got any questions, don't be afraid to ask. So when you say previously, um, oh gosh, what am I looking at? Uh, previously authorized borrowing, that means anything that was on last year's town meeting yeah, so when I talked about previously authorized borrowing, I was basically talking about what we authorized in November, the fire trucks and the roadside okay. mower. Okay. <laughs> because last uh, March, if I remember correctly, we didn't do any borrowing after last year's time. So this is just from the special meeting? Right. Okay. Right. Well, Mark and I had... A little bit of back and forth there last week. Um, he's a little bit more in favor of amortizing things out. Um, and as Bill has suggested here earlier, he kind of took off the table, possibly borrowing for paving projects because of their volatile life expectancy and <coughs> in fear that the, you know, the borrowed money might exceed the, the life of the road. So you're paying on a dead horse, essentially. Um, I came in to see Bill about a couple of other things today. Uh, last week he had suggested that we kind of sit on this, think about it through the course of the week, and I did just that. Um, I think it's been pretty well known by the board here that I don't, like to borrow money any more than we have to. Um, so thinking about this a little bit more in depth, trying to keep in mind where we're at 
iron iron paving projects, the number of paving projects that we still have yet to come. I'm not necessarily in favor of borrowing any money to satisfy this problem. I would rather see an increase of three and possibly four cents to take care of the issue that we have here in front of us and dedicate that money, raise the money necessary to take care of the paving projects. Um, and if there's anything additional, maybe go towards whatever else it can go towards. But I look at it this way. Um, if we do a split 50-50, borrow half, borrow and raise some money, some of that borrowed money is going to be out there for a number of years. Um, and to raise, to just raise the money to go to maybe four cents, or I, he, I had even suggested based on the cost of the paving projects that we're going to be uh, involved in here in the next couple of years. And I hate to say this, and I'm hesitant to say it, but if it meant even going a bit higher than that, than four cents, once you raise that money, and that money would go towards this year's project, which is paving Maple Street and Howard Ave., You've raised the tax rate by four cents, plus or minus. That money's dedicated towards the paving project. We're not, we're not having to borrow to satisfy our problem. And next year, instead of having a loan over our head, we've got that money that is now freed up from having raised it this year, spent the money on on uh, Maple Street and Howard Ave. So next year, that same four cents is available again to go towards another paving project, whether it be Guptill Road, Barnes Hill, Bush Hill, whatever. And I'm looking at it as a perhaps a one-time increase. I'd like to think that it's a one-time increase to get us through the next several years to satisfy our paving project needs. And once we get through the bulk of these projects, either that, in the next four or five years, either that can drop off if we feel we don't need that or portion of it, at, let's call it four cents for argument's sake. Let's say once we get through this quagmire of these heavier road problems that we come to the conclusion that, geez, we're at the point where we need, we're at a manageable point now. We're no longer in a desperate scenario where our roads are deteriorated. We've gotten away from that. Is there a possibility that we can give back two cents of that? We don't need it anymore. And the other two cents will help go towards ma maintaining those roads that have been brought back to where, where they should be. Or does that money just stay there? Uh, allows us not to borrow. My fear of borrowing is it's kind of like dog crap. Once you get it on your foot, it's there for a while. Uh, can't just shake it off. And, and with a tax rate increase, let's say something happens in the next couple of years. Um, and again, a downturn in the economy, a drastic downturn or a shift in, in the economy that puts a, a more harder burden on our financial state. And we need somehow to cut back. We can't cut back a borrowed loan. It's there. We're on the hook. Uh, where if we have the available tax rate, yeah, maybe for whatever reason we got to kick the can on a couple of paving projects in order to reduce the budget, but we have the ability to do that. Where, 
where borrowed money you don't you don't have that e that ease of getting rid of it. So what number were you thinking about as a how many what's how many cents on the tax rate were you thinking of? Yeah. Well, before Bill had kind of landed on a final number here, he said to me at a meeting there him and I had I don't know, I don't have enough information to tell you exactly where I'm going to land here. And I said, well, if I had to speculate, it's going to be somewhere between three and four cents. And here we are, uh, right at that number. Um, I guess I'd defer to Bill as to whether or not, I don't feel that three cents is adequate. I feel that four cents might do the job. Tell me uh, if, a, if you had a four cent in increase and you have a $300,000 house, what would that cost you per year? Well, we did it last week with a $400,000 home and it was $160 additional, if I'm correct. Four cent increase, you said? Uh, how much property value? I, I, was, I was doing 300. $120. Pardon me? $120. On a 400 it would have been 100 and 160 So with that, I also asked Bill what the potential education tax rate increase um, combined with this four-cent municipal tax rate might end up costing us, and I think you said $400 total. On a four on a four on a four hundred thousand dollar home. So it, on a four hundred thousand dollar home, the education costs, the education in, possible education increase, and our municipal tax rate of four cents would add an additional four hundred dollars to a four hundred thousand dollar home. Or a three or three hundred on your three hundred thousand dollar home. Yeah, I guess that would be right. Yeah. So and I in. Trust me, I'm fully aware of the fact that it's not an increase that any of us want to see, but yet we're in this predicament where you know, years of not being able to uh, adequately put enough revenue in our, in our CIP budgets to keep up with our paving projects has now forced us into this scenario where we really, there's no escape. We have to deal with it somehow. It's just whether or not we want to leverage ourselves, which I'm in fear of doing. I always like to keep an ace in the hole. And, uh, and if we can prevent ourselves from leveraging ourselves out for any of this, uh, it gives us, it gives us a, a safety net. Uh, and like I said, if for some reason we're up against the wall whether it be next year, year after, uh, and we need to shake a tax increase uh, or reduce the tax somehow, we have the option of doing that. Where if you're tied to a, a you know, a note, uh, it's pretty tough to pretty tough to scale back. So that's my pitch. And so, um, well, somebody else got asked a question. I want to add something up first. Um, on that, Bill, on your original work, you said three cents, and then what was your borrowing number? Um, new borrowing of $393,200 above the what was authorized last fall. So last fall's loan will be going into place. Yeah, we, we uh, haven't borrowed anything based on what we, you know, the fire trucks and all the rest of it. We have not borrowed anything yet. We bought one of the fire trucks for $460,000. We had cash. We still have cash in the bank. Um, so I'm not going to borrow until we have to. I typically try not to um, 
try not to borrow until um, after the, so when the payment is due a year from now, that it's after taxes has come in, because I, I don't want to have to borrow tax anticipation money to pay a, a debt if we can have our, our borrowing come due in, uh, if you can add up these numbers that are in, in gold here, so that, that, that. It's on that one page. No, on all three pages. So the transfer from each of the funds. So the one other thing I'd kind of so, like to add now that's kind of brought to my mind here, if we're talking about a, if we're negotiating over a penny, um, whether to borrow or not to borrow. If it's if it's one hundred and sixty dollars on a four hundred thousand dollar house, a penny would be forty dollar difference. Uh, and that difference is to leverage or to not leverage. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to understand exactly <coughs> the scenarios before I comment too far. Yeah. So again, I try to look at it independently, Mark, you know, identify things that were reasonable to borrow for, and I came up with the 393, uh, and then raised the money on the tax rate. So... But an extra penny doesn't get us 400,000, right? An extra penny gets us about... 70, 70 or 80,000. So I guess I'm trying to understand... The next one penny gets about seventy-six thousand dollars right now. So I don't really understand the three cents plus the three ninety-three, and somehow the four cent no borrowing is an equal scenario. Wouldn't it be like three cents with eighty thousand in borrowing, or four cents with no borrowing, or something like that? Yeah. I guess I'm, I don't fully. I'm just trying to understand. Right. Let me let me add these numbers first, and then I'll. So my other concern is, and I think we talked about this last week, is if we do this scenario of splitting borrow and raise, we're going to be back here next year having to do the same thing. And I was just wondering if we, and then a year after that, we're going to be doing the same thing. Well, I think that's where you got to look at your outstanding <coughs> debt chart because you have debts that are decreasing on a yearly basis and some are falling off. So... Potentially, you're not if you're replacing debt with new debt. So, in certain times, you're going to have to consider taking debt, I think, on larger purchases. Um, but I do agree with you that the last thing I want to see us do is get the CIPs um, basically depleted on a yearly basis, because I think the whole point of CIP is that we're building up some level of cash for large purchases. I guess that's where I started to want to try to take right. the conversation so, a little bit. So back to the what you just said, I I started with saying, okay, how much would if we raise three cents and just uh, dump that into the CIP? How much would that be? And that and that was the the two hundred twenty-nine thousand, two hundred thirty thousand dollars. And then when I went through and identified what things we could borrow, I was trying to do those independently. So then when I had both numbers. $393,000 of borrowing, $230,000 of additional tax money. I just threw it all into the CIP. And that's where we end up with $268,000 fund balance in there next year at this time of year. So then at that point, it's like, how much are you comfortable with? We had $30,000 in the bank after 2019. Do we really need $230,000 more than that? So if you read following through on my, as I get down to the end of my memo, it's like if you lowered the tax rate to two cents and reduced the borrowing by $120,000, you'd end up with $72,000 in the CIP at the end of next year, which is, you know, 2.25 times more than you had last year. So I wasn't necessarily saying you should borrow 393 and raise three cents. I was just trying to see what that would generate, where that would let the CIP end, and then allow you folks to kind of talk about it from there. But to your point, um, right now, into all the CIPs, and I, I added the three cent number, so I've got to take that out. 
So that was 1.1? 1. 1. 1.18. 1.18. So subtract $230,000 from that. So, you know, right now, I told you, you know, we're, I think without the three cent increase, we're putting about $900,000 into the CIPs. And if we're going to spend $500,000 a year just on paving, there's only 400 th for everything else. So you're not going to be able to meet your needs without borrowing unless you want to add 15 cents to the tax rate. Because there's bridges, there's vehicles, there's fire vehicles and everything else. And I'm not trying to argue against your point. I'm just saying that if we raised four cents and just dumped that into the CIP, four cents every year forever isn't ever going to get us enough. Because we got more than paving to do. Right. And we're going to, we're and using I mean, I five ninths of what we're raising for paving. Already. Right, and I specifically was talking about generating the revenue by by raising the tax rate of four cents, uh, which would hopefully get us through this these next series of years in addressing most of the big pay, big paving projects without having to borrow money, so that when those bridges and other things come come due, we have the ability to leverage for those, uh, and then to your point, Mark, you talked about some of these notes reducing every year, that's to our benefit. That, that can help mitigate uh, increases in the inflation of the budget for the next, you know, I won't say foreseeable years, but possibly next year and the year after so that we don't have to go after more for some other reason. You know, so, it just, just inflation rates in the general budget itself can be knocked, can be, can be, you know, evened out by, by the reductions in the, in the notes. So it, it's not going to help for this year's town meeting, but, and I, we talked about it last year and unfortunately the Main Street project getting going, that took up some of my time, even though not as much as it took up of Bill Woodruff's and, and Barb Farr's time. But within the last year or so, I have updated lists from Celia with regard to highway equipment that needs to be purchased over the next 15 years, and I, I kind of showed you that last week. I have the list from Gary in the fire department and then that list that I passed out a week ago from ALEC, which was about infrastructure, not about paving, but about bridges and culverts and stuff like that. So I think I'm in a position right now where probably, you know, I'm going to relax for a few weeks after we're done with this, but probably by May, I can come back to the board and say, okay, this is our capital needs except for paving for the foreseeable future. The grand scheme. And, and although I know that you concentrate on the paved roads and I think, you know, there's a good reason why you do, I think if we s realize that, you know, within a few years here we've bumped up to committing to $500,000 a year for paving from the 250 to 300 that we have. That's a pretty big increase. So I think if we, for the foreseeable future, call paving a half a million dollars a year, right. and then look at everything else that we have on a schedule. And, you know, I've got a big spreadsheet that's three times as big as this page, and it's that long. And I've got, you know, investing rates in there and all this stuff. We don't have enough money to invest our CIP funds anymore in anything long term. We used to in actually invest it in, in securities. If we had $286,000, like I suggested in, in that spreadsheet, if we did the three cent tax rate and borrowing, 
we wouldn't invest two hundred eighty-six thousand dollars in the in the market because we know we're going to have to spend more than two hundred eighty-six thousand dollars last year. I mean, next year. Right. We'd put it in the CD, maybe. <coughs> but within a couple of months, I can have the future um, not down to the penny, but a really good estimate of what we need to do. And, and then you'll be able to see what you can, what you're going to be able to do. I don't think you're going to be able to do it all without borrowing. You're going to have to borrow. There's, At some point. there's no way that you're going to be able to do all the things that are on those lists without borrowing. And again, I'm not, I told Chris this morning, the easiest thing to do, uh, and the easiest thing to do is simply add to the tax rate because the borrowing and the, the scenario that I put together for borrowing here, you know, it, we're going to have to borrow money by note and then a year from now, we're going to have to work with the lawyer and the bank, and we're going to have to try to refund some of that and turn some of those notes into bonds. Or we could go to the voters and simply ask them, uh, either at a special town meeting or at next year's town meeting, do you want to convert this much money from notes to bonds? But the select board has the authority to do that on its own motion. Um, the borrowing scheme, as we go forward, uh, and trying to determine on the handout that I passed out uh, what our future uh, debt service expenses are, you know, there's, it's a complicated matter. So it's a lot easier if you just say, you know, let's make a 55 cent tax rate, raise the taxes by four cents. That's a simple thing to do. And it's a, not a risky thing to do. When you go to the to the borrowing markets, you know they're going to look at your debt. Uh, if you follow Front Porch Forum, there have been people that have commented, "Well, the Ethan Allen Institute put out a, a report card for all the Vermont towns, and you know Waterbury's number is a 49, and that's not very good, and you know we're in fiscal uh, peril." Well. I don't think we're in fiscal peril because I don't believe the Ethan Allen Institute gave any credit to the two and a half million dollars or so that we've got in reserve funds. They, they're just looking at, oh, you've got this much debt and you've got this much of a budget and that percentage is high and you've got at the end of the year, you've got you know a four million dollar operating budget and you've got hundred thousand dollars in the bank and you know they want you to have 20 percent or whatever it is if they factored in what we've got in reserves the tax stabilization fund is a million dollars uh, we've got other funds that you know are significant I don't think we're as bad off as they say but you know the banks are going to say I think they would let us borrow the 1.4 million dollars that's what we're talking about because it's $393,000 more than we had authority for last year. And even though I trimmed the amount that I anticipated borrowing for all these things by one year's worth, it's still $1.4 million of, of new borrowing in 2020 if we do this. So it's a lot simpler to just raise the tax rate. And it's probably from a standpoint of uh, fiscal responsibility, some of the people like Ethan Allen Institute would think it's you're in, in a better position. But I put this together to remind you again, and this is probably not completely accurate, I, I, uh, but what I did was update this. So at the top of the page, you can see what we owed uh, in 2017. Um, and you know, you add those two things together, and I, I, I guess I didn't do it, but five million two forty-five and eight hundred and fifty-three, so you know, six six plus million dollars of outstanding debt in two thousand seventeen. Um, in two thousand, at the end of two thousand nineteen, six hundred and sixty-seven thousand three hundred. This is down two thirds of the way down on the left-hand column. And 4.4 million to others. 
So, you know, we're a little more than $5 million now. So, you know, we paid off between 17 and, and 19 a considerable amount of money, um, almost a million bucks. Um, and then in 2020, if we added this borrowing that I'm uh, talking about here, um, you can see over in the bottom left, new debt issued 2020, the $1.4 million is there. 198450 is to us because I would, I would uh, of the borrowing that we're talking about doing for next year, I would, I would borrow almost $200,000 from ourselves and then $1.2 million from the bank. But across the top of the page is our current debt. Um, before we added the fire department stuff and everything last year. And then down the bottom, the chart shows that if we had the uh, $1.4 million of debt outstanding, I, I, I actually did it on the $1.2 million, I think, $80,510 $80, of principal would be necessary over a 15 year amortization. So while a lot of these things would have 20 year lives, I've tried to take into consideration what Chris has said. You could make it a lower amount if you borrowed it over a longer period of time, but I just took 15 years. And then you can see the interest there. And then <coughs> moving to the right, what the total payments are. And I added to the total payments there uh, the, the 128,815 that would show up in 2022 as a total payment. Um, that is uh, adding 48 and 80. And uh, I guess it must be the principal and interest over current going over further. Um, anyway, somewhere I added the interest on the, on the money that we would be borrowing from ourselves. I didn't include the principal there. But you can do this um, and borrow this $1.4 million. And the impact to the tax rate in the worst year, which I think would be next year, looks like it's about 1.6 cents added to your tax rate if you if you borrow this money. So um, again, I think borrowing is a reasonable tool, especially when we're talking about a public entity where, you know, at the end of uh, at the end of 30 years, you're not going to own your house free and clear because you're going to have to buy a, a new house or a new truck or a new bridge or whatever it is. The, the, the paying for this stuff, it, it never ends. So you're going to always have to finance it either through a tax rate or through a borrowing or, or a combination. So um, anyway, I, I'm, it's just my opinion. But I think these are the facts. This is what the borrowing costs us here on this page. 1.6 cents in 2022. I have a few comments. Um, one, I think you did a good <coughs> stab at everything. I too believe in that we need to look at a combination of tax increase and long-term borrowing. I would hate to borrow for things such as paving and stuff like that because that's really a short-term borrowing thing, you know, but if we're gonna put culverts and bridge work and stuff like that, I, don't, I have a lot less problem with, with borrowing for that type of infrastructure needs. The one thing I looked, I know I spent several hours looking through the budget and I, I don't know if it's, feasible even to look at it now, but looking at all the budget line items, again, you put a good job putting everything together, but we never seem to look at decrease, significant decreases, program cuts, you know, cuts in different places that would make more of a major impact. And I don't know if, you know, that's probably something we need to sit down, maybe not at a board meeting and kind of 
Again, it's probably not for this year's budget. Well, but you can only do it at a board meeting. You can't sit down anywhere else and talk about it. So. Well, you can't. You can't strategize. You know, just like have a. <clears throat> no. 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 You've got it. You're a public elected body. I know we're so. a public elected body, but you could come in and on a one-on-one -on -one basis and talk with Bill about yeah, your thoughts, you, and he the can. The board cannot get together and and not do it in a public meeting. Right. Or, or, you know. I think it's more of an informational kind of thing, not, you know, making decisions. No, I understand. And, you know, I, I, um, I would be hard pressed if you asked me where can we cut. Um, you know, back, um, I don't know, five years ago, I can't remember what it was, uh, you know, we presented a budget. And the voters at town meeting told us to add money to it because they wanted a full-time recreation director. Right. That's the only thing new that we've had. Right. And, you know, I'm we're, we're paying it. a little bit more there, but, you know, the programs that he's offering and, the, and you know, they're generating some revenue that it, at least it's, um, you know, those new programs are, uh, are Help, paying for helping themselves. Helping mitigate. But, yeah. you know... Uh, uh, I know you're, this is your, you know, you're just finishing your first year, Mike, but, yep. um, you know, I look at our office staff compared to other towns and see where other towns have municipal manager, a finance director, a, a, a human resources director, two or three bookkeepers, and, you know, we have me and a bookkeeper and a you know, a clerical I've said a long time, you guys do a great so job. With I'm the, not sure where doing. we're going to cut the budget. Right. That's my point. And, and like people want this parking enforcement officer. I don't know where we can find, you know, addition, you know, as I told you, I said the thing that all the people who complain about the parking, I said, you're, you're a volunteer staff to give out tickets. And, you know, I, I'm sure they're not going to accept that very well. And, you know, if the board wants to cut, that's fine. Uh, it's just, it's, it's not possible right now. We, oh, we can't I, I, I understand. We can't That's do it what for I'm this saying year. for next year. I'm and, uh, yeah. you know, Chris has talked about, you know, cutting the SALT budget. And, you know, the budget that we have for a SALT line item is far less than we spent in 2019. So exactly. we're already rolling the dice a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate your sentiment, Mike, but I think that, you know, uh, for us to go in there and, and um, you know, like Bill said, there's there's nothing, there's not one line item that we can go to right. go to bat for. But the things that we can do are uh, in in education of uh, our employees of uh, trying to get a handle on wasteful practices, mm -hmm. and that 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 can show up in the bottom line rather quickly. If we can, if we can get um, some of the, you know, I know Chris is really making too many before. passes with the snow plow. You know, th th there might be some small changes that we could, we could affect um, that could that could turn into giant changes uh, in the amount we're spending to do what we do. So does that mean some kind of um, inventory and? How do, you, well, how do you suss that out? I'll, I'll throw this into the mix. One thing I've been thinking about doing, we had a conversation here a while back, I don't know how many of you remember it, where the road foreman was here and I talked about uh, the goal to accumulate overtime at the highway department. Um, it's, it's not just this town, it's, it's a statewide issue. Every town highway department does a similar thing, including our, our state agency of transportation highway guys. Um, I have a son-in-law who is an engineer for the state, and during the winter, because of their lack of help, they, uh, they put him behind the steering wheel of the plow truck uh, to help with maintaining their road conditions during the winter. Uh, at that meeting, I wasn't looking to pick a fight as to the overtime issue, but I was more concerned about what was happening in those hours that accumulated that overtime. And as I had suggested, 
there's really not a lot to do during the winter, so the guys get sent out on the roads to check the roads, and they're fully loaded in their trucks, and nine times out of ten they come back empty, whether it needed to be emptied or not, and uh, for reasons that they don't want to be accused of not doing their job and whatever. Um, so thinking about that a bit, uh, I will throw this proposal out there for you to think about in the future. You know, I'm, I, as I said, I'm going to bring this discussion hopefully to the table from an environmental standpoint uh, at town meeting when we get into the, the uh, climate change issue. But um, well, it seems would, like I'm not finished with Jane, please uh, give me a second here. Um, I would be interested in wondering if on those days when roads don't need to be dealt with, uh, if they come in in the morning and do what they have to do and the roads are fine for the rest of the day rather than them hanging around and going out in the afternoon to do what I had just suggested, can we send them home with pay? That way they're not... They're not burning the fuel, they're not wearing the trucks, they're not spreading the well, material. You know, Is that an option? It's, it's an option. Um, I did something like that in Island Pond when I was there over 30 years ago. I talked about it here. So, for instance, what, what I uh, proposed, and I have to think about the, the actual proposal was, you know, if you come in today and you work two hours and there's nothing else to do and you go home um, you know we'll we'll pay you for the day but if it snows starting at midnight and you come out or it's at eight o'clock and you come out um, then those four hours will be added to your two hours and you know in other words we're not going to just pay you for the day and then you get overtime when you come out at 8 o'clock at night. You, you get paid for the day, but if you didn't work those four hours, let's say, but you went home at noontime. So you worked from... from so you're saying you give them that four eight hours? Eight to four. Kind of like credit time. Eight to, four, eight to noon they worked, so they worked those four hours, and then they went home. And if that was, and they did that all week long, they would have worked... 20 hours and they would have got paid for 40 hours, right? right? right. But if they came out at 8 o'clock at night and worked till midnight, then you just add those four hours to the four hours they worked in the morning and it would be eight hours regular for the time. day. Regular time. At regular time. And, you know, the, the response I get back, and I understand, is, look, you know, we have to be around. We can't go away in the winter, we've got to be available, and you don't give us on call time pay, so, you know, if we're working, so we, we've tried different things, and it, it hasn't. So they want their overtime is what you're basically telling me, which I'm not arguing with that. I'm just okay? saying, I mean, it right. hasn't been brought up for a number of years, but. Uh, so I'm saying that, about, can this scenario s still have a good impact from a budget perspective, they still keep their overtime or some negotiated in between, if that's possible. I'm not looking to chop their feet off from the overtime perspective. I'm looking to s cut back on some of these other issues. I, I get it. You know, I understand. Right. And so. We can have a conversation. I'm, okay. I, yeah. I think what you heard me say is, I had a similar idea. We tried to do it. And how it, did it work? So you're saying that's how it worked in Island Pond? When, when I left, we were doing it there. And, you know, it was only a two-man road crew in Island Pond. It was very different than what you have here. Yeah. Anyway, um, there's a lot of things we can talk about after two weeks from now, right? You know? Yeah, we, understood. Let's not get oh, bogged down. Okay, I was just going to maybe now. Nat had some, because he's the one that brought it up about looking at practices. It might be a way to save money. It seems to me, and so I didn't mean to cut you up, maybe you have some thoughts. It seems like, you know, you can, you can involve these people, you know, there's their jobs, have, have a kind of a shakedown or a, um, a, a conversation with them and use them to help try to solve the problem. You know, how do you think we can save money? You know, what are you, what are you doing? And 
I would I would make it an organized um, activity. You know, whether you need a facilitator to help you or something, but just make it serious and see if they come up. They they must have some creative ideas too. What are they willing to offer? So part of part of my goal on town meeting, and I don't want to get into Quagmire here talking about this, but uh, part of my goal at town meeting is to turn the responsibility of this particular topic into the hands of the people at town meeting. That part of the reason why these things haven't changed over the last 30 years is because of the public's response if they're not out there doing what they're supposed to be doing or what they, you know, they get the phone calls, the bitching. Uh, my road's not sanded. I, I, I can't go uphill in two-wheel drive with bald tires. What the hell's the matter with you? How come you're not here? Um, I'm going to turn this around and say to the public, we'll see how serious you are about solving some of these climate issues. Put your money where your mouth is. Here's one of the problems that this town is faced with, that it's going to take cooperation from you people, the public, to do certain things to lessen the ability or the requirement of the town crew to have to go out and make sure that you guys have the red carpet laid out for you. Let's we'll see how serious you are about wanting to contribute to changing some of these problems, environmental problems. So I'm going to put a responsibility in their lap and make them commit to us to allow us the flexibility to either put a policy in place that our highway department will have to follow or do something, you know, do something. Uh, but the same person that's going to complain about the services, then they're going to be the same person that's going to complain about the increases in taxes. We see this all the time. You know, people want services, then they complain about their taxes going up, and that's where sometimes you have to look at what services you can supply the public at a reasonable dollar amount. So we're, and so I the agree goal here you. is to kill two birds with one stone. If they exactly. agree, if the public can agree to allow the town right. to maybe not be spreading so much product on the roads and you know, hammering the trucks more when they shouldn't have to be. They should be parked in the garage instead of out on the, and beating the hell out of the roads. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a budget savings, so. So can I just make a suggestion? I, sure. I think that might be reasonable, but maybe you could have this conversation, the meeting before town meeting and talk about what we're gonna do on town meeting because we're not gonna be able to change the right, budget, right. which no, I got to right. get right. Yeah. this done, uh, and we have deadlines, and uh, you know I'm hopeful that we don't have to, that we can not only agree to something tonight, but we can have enough information that it's finalized that we don't have to come back next Monday to, to put a stamp on it. So, I we need to kind of get back to yep. this yep. stuff for tonight. So having said that, I'm going to pitch my one last pitch here, and then I'm going to leave it up to you guys to make the final call here. I just don't feel like we have enough to even go there yet, right? Like I, I haven't, I don't feel like I have a clear understanding of if we do no borrowing, what's the number? Is four cents enough? I don't think it is, right? For this year, it is. Sure. Okay, so yep. four cents would be enough. What would we end up with in the CIP? At four cents. Well, um, well, if it's if one cent is seventy six thousand, it's around three hundred and four thousand for four cents. Right, but we had is that what we need? bills presented us with three cents and borrowing of three ninety three to end up with two hundred and something in the CIP, I believe. Yeah. All right, Chris, so, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm just trying to fully understand okay. the scenarios yeah. here before. So uh, I'll just add to this scenario of the four cents, okay? Uh, if this four cents is available to us year after year, which it should be if it goes, you know, in my mind it's going towards paving, okay? It'll come out in a wash somewhere, but I'm kind of dedicating this in my mind to the four cents to the paving problem, problems that we have that should solve them in, in the next four years, five years, whatever it takes, if that number 
stays available for that. And then after that, once the roads are, and I think I may have mentioned this, once the roads are back to a manageable point, then we can start to do, like you suggested, the, you know, get into the overlay uh, uh, mode as opposed to the re total reconstruct mode here. And that four cents, whether we, if we choose not to give up any of it, and who knows what'll happen with asphalt prices between now and the end of the next five years, but it, if they stay relatively the same, uh, that four cents doing just simply repaves would do a lot more road uh, in one year than than we do now from a total rebuild. So, Mark, I, if my see if this makes sense to you. If you start with the ending fund balance that I have on this page, which is two sixty eight three eighty two. Um, I gotta bring my own calculator from now on. Don't fall asleep on us, Ian. <laughs> so if you start with like a big horse tranquilizer, this stuff. If you start with the 268 382, which is got three cents worth of uh, tax increase and and three hundred and ninety-three thousand dollars of borrowing, right? So if you start with two sixty-eight three fifty-two subtract the 393 200 of borrowing from it so that means you've done no no borrowing and then oh no then you'd add um you'd only add one cent so seventy six thousand so you'd be you'd be just you'd be about fifty thousand dollars under still so four cents probably won't quite do it to get this just to break e at zero. With no right. borrowing. Right. Change. So you have to do some, I think you've got to do some borrowing. So if we were at three cents on the tax rate, how much borrowing would we have to do to maintain? I think. Total number that we need, 393. Um, 393,200 that hasn't been previously authorized. How much, Nate? 393,000. Yep, that's right. Right. 393,200. On top of what's already been granted or authorized. Oops, sorry. That's kind of where I would go. The three. Three with some borrowing. Did you ever have any time to think about the the option two the two options to present to the voters and let them choose which they would prefer to do? We talked about allowing them to choose whether we wanted to borrow or just raise the tax rate and give them. I don't think. I hate to be, maybe I'm cynical, <laughs> that but knowledge. Yeah, at, at, at town meeting, they're not going to have an, you know, there's going to be a select group that's going to have an in-depth knowledge of the budget and stuff like that, but you're going based upon emotions there. You're going to be, yeah. be, be. How many hours do you want to be at the town meeting? <laughs> I don't even think it's that. I think some people are, can grasp it. Others are just going to go based upon emotions. On, well, I think, I, as I said last week, do you have the warning here? Yeah. I think we have to lay out a, a budget for them, and then it's either yay or nay. They, they decide. They don't right. think it's right. So the amount that the board is going to recommend the tax increase to be is going to be in the general fund budgets. And then the, um, the capital budget 
you're going to ask the voters to authorize a sum of money to be expended from the capital funds. And um, we probably should, I, I didn't catch this earlier, and we should, and to authorize a sum of money to be expended from the capital funds and uh, to authorize the select board to borrow. So on that one, you, you can have your conversation. We know what the value of the um, expenditures that we want to spend this year. It's $1,984,000 that we have to spend uh, in capital budgeting. Between and the dump truck, the one ton, the two fire trucks, well, one fire the truck. tractor. One fire truck. Oh, OK. One fire truck, the tractor, the paving. Yeah, that's what I mean, the yeah. mower. Uh, the CIP the paving projects. And everything. Yep. So you, you're going to have that amount that you are going to ask for the authority to spend. And then you can, at, in the same motion, say and authorize up to X amount to be borrowed. So probably we should switch, if we just switched Article 7 and 8, flip them, have them talk about the capital first and how much they want to borrow. And then if they don't want to borrow, then when we get to what's Article 7 now, you're going to have to say, we're going to have to amend the budget that's in the book because the one in the book has three cents or four cents or two cents, whatever you decide tonight. And you'd have to add that in to the budget to increase that yeah. night. Yeah. Because as to your, your question about giving them the option, I think we need to propose a budget. Yes. And then, you know, on the floor, they have the right to, as it always happens at town meeting, change that budget based upon discussion. Yeah, I really think that the board needs to recommend what exactly. it wants. So and then react to the public. Right. So we're gonna have you're gonna have to decide this, not just wait until the public can decide. Exactly. If if so, I'll just I'll throw this out again, and and then I'll let you guys land the plane. Um, he's as he said in a couple of weeks he'll be able to, or shortly there, thereafter he'll be able to come to us with some form of a grand scheme for the next foreseeable future. That grand scheme, as he said, we won't be able to get out of it without borrowing. I'm reluctant to borrow now based on the knowledge that future borrowing is inevitable. Uh, and I'd just rather put that off until it's absolutely necessary. And that's where I stop. So is, is your proposal like a four and a half or five cent? Yeah, if it, 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 whatever it takes. We to need get, 390. I'm getting like more. 4.6, but I might be wrong. Yeah, I, th I think it's it's close. It's between four and a half and five somewhere. I think we ended up 48, negative 48 thousand. And the four and a that. half doesn't get us any CIP there's no, addition, right? There's, there's no, no like right. So you're going nothing to, to carry over, but close next to year. five to have the thirty the thirty thousand dollars that we had at the end of nineteen and the aggregate. I think you'd need five cents because we were minus forty eight before, yeah. and to get to thirty, that's about seventy or eighty. So you need about five cents to get to twenty five thousand dollars. Five cents would be what? eighty. No, I was going to ask on a three hundred thousand. Well, if it was one hundred and sixty, it died another. Another forty. Yeah. Two hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the one thing that, and and I, and I, so I totally respect the concern surrounding debt, and I think it's something that we can't take lightly when we consider taking on debt. But I think the one thing that we have to consider is the impact, especially, you know, as we know that the school taxes are increasing, that debt at times is a smart way to do business. Um, there are the large debts that are going to be coming off. I know it's not necessarily shown in this chart, but, you know, in 10 years, 
which you know if we're catching up on paving and in the 10 year mark we have one loan right now that I think is taking just over two hundred thousand dollars a year in debt payment um, you know these are big numbers and then in five more years you basically have those two large bonds paid off um, you know each year we're seeing a decrease of 35 and 22 and 17 and that's compared to the previous year so we're paying down debt we're paying less principal and interest payment on a yearly basis if we don't take on new debt. Um, I just think it's more, I fear going to the voters with a five cent increase. Um, and with that five cent increase, we would still be putting almost nothing into the CIP, which is another concern of mine. Yeah, so that, that portion of money that we would spend on the paving would be there next year without having to increase for it because it's a one-time expenditure for Maple Street and Howard Ave this year, so you understand. So that money, yeah, but I so you would that go, that be going into the CIP that everyone paid money. two cents more this that year and two cents more the next year for something that I think we can do through the use of of debt. I guess one of the questions I had to Bill was. You had mentioned that we had been paying down our our own debt to ourselves, and we could recapture some of that to ourselves, which maybe you were starting to mention some of this could be, but um, I, I always like the idea that some of this could be our own debt with interest paid to ourselves. Yeah, so on this sheet, uh, and I was just looking at that as you were talking, and at the end of 2017, we owed $853,000 out of... Uh, like 6.1 million to ourselves. At the end of 19, we owe 667. That's two thirds of the way down the page. And then if you added this, would be up to 772. So I was sitting here saying, well. You, you were the 186 we, was what you were adding. That was subtracting. Uh, the, the 186 was the difference between the 853, 300 at the top of the page and the 667, 300 now so we paid ourselves back one hundred eighty six thousand dollars since 2017 we have less debt to ourselves by one hundred eighty six thousand so you know i'm thinking to myself well why 772 if we went back up to 853 what we were at 17 and i think at the high water mark we were around 900 um, that we had borrowed from ourselves the, the challenge, of course, is when you're borrowing from yourselves, you know, we've already, we've already got $667,000 out of that that we were investing before. We're paying ourselves back 4%, so it's a good fixed income. But how much can we take out without risking? But it might be a good year to take more out because, you know, the, it's been 12 years that the stock market's been going up like that, one of these years, it's going to go down. So, um, but I think that, you know, there's a lot of analysis that I would do before we borrow anything. We're, we're, I'm going to try not to borrow anything from an outside source until at least after July and preferably not until November or December because I'd like to get a full year's worth and, and have to pay the principal and interest after we've collected taxes next year as opposed to before. So, you know, there's a lot of analysis that can happen between now and then when, when it comes time to borrow. Um, I think, you know, Chris, my only, and I don't even think this is a disagreement with you, I don't think we're ever going to be in a position where we're not going to have to borrow. I think borrowing is going to have to be a regular occurrence and we've had a couple of years now where we didn't even borrow from ourselves and we've been able to pay ourselves back but now you know we ended the year with thirty thousand dollars in the uh, well we ended the year with negative in the CIPs because we had a fire truck that we had to buy last year that we didn't think we were going to have to but if the budget had come out right we're going to have $30,000 in the bank at the end of the year, and we've got a million dollars worth of stuff to buy. So um, we're, I think borrowing is going to be a regular occurrence. I don't think we're ever going to be in a position where we can do everything that we need to do without borrowing. 
And in response to that, Bill, it's a sound business practice to do that. You know, I know, Chris, I know you, you don't like the idea of borrowing, but I, I'd i rather see a little less on the tax rate because people are going to start, you know, our taxes are getting higher and higher and the education, you know, they always blame, they'll blame your town as much as they'll blame the education system. But, you know, because we're, we're just there. And I think if we could moderate that impact, I think that's going to help in the borrowing. It's just a necessary evil and it's just sound business practice. Most businesses will do that. Bill, Bill the proposed borrowing um, built in a surplus. You know, if, if we were actually trying to do a, apples for apples, I think we'd be closer to somewhere in the, ten, in the 10 cent range, right? If we didn't borrow the 400. Am I doing that correct? Say that again, I'm sorry. Um, I guess I'm trying to fully, if we went into this and we wanted to do exactly what you proposed under the 3 cent increase and the borrowing of the 400,000, that's four, 393, right? 393, yeah. What's the equivalent tax rate that represents? If we just raise taxes to it it's isn't it more like really we're building up a surplus right so seven seven cents into, yeah it's up there right? seven into yeah so three, it would three, be three, um, three what 93 you said it would be seven or eight cents 393 in borrowing plus two twenty nine that would be thirty three forty so that's 622, and if you divide that by 76, 700, 466, or whatever it is, so it's about eight cents. Eight cents. So that's where, like, we have to start talking apples to apples, because the scenario is three cents borrow 400 or eight cents, or we're deciding not to put as much into the CIP. Right. The, but remember, the eight cents or the three cents and borrowing 400 leaves us. To 68 at the end of no, the No, I know that. Bank. Yeah, I mean, so then yeah. the question is, could you do three cents and borrow less? Yeah, I mean, right. that's I, what I said over here. Right, right. I know that, I know that, I know that. But I'm just like, I, I feel like we're being presented with don't borrow, put this, put four cents or five cents at it and end up in the same spot, but it's not. We're not going to end up with what, what we're talking about in the scenario that we borrow 400 and, and raise taxes three to get, so we could not borrow. I don't think three cents is enough. I think we'd have to go to five cents. Um, five cents gets you to zero. Right, I know, yeah, I know that. <laughs> and your concern is not rolling over with anything into the Yeah, I mean, uh, my, my concern is but that. You actually are because that money comes available next year because it's an increase in the tax rate. It's a one-time expense. Yeah, but you gotta look at the year. debt service payments only you know, whatever the 400,000 is going to be amortized over the length of the loan. So you're, you're using that money now and you're, you have the ability to use other money later. It's, it's a different way of doing it. And yes, there's an interest component to it, but I don't think the way you're looking at it is necessarily correct. Right. And remember, we talked about this last week when the CIP fund was established the voters authorized a bond, I think it was a 10-year bond, and borrowed $650,000 and put it in the bank and used a little of it that first year to buy some things. But they were willing back then, when the interest rate was significantly higher than it is now, to borrow $650,000 and put that money aside and use it and then add to it. So, um, you know, it's been a while since we've had the money in the bank and taking kind of the cue from you, Chris, about what you were saying to the library commissioners about their uh, trust fund, you know, taking it out of the trust, putting it in there, and, and ending the year with a surplus so that next year they would have it. Um, you know, I know it's not quite the same thing when you're borrowing money, but if you borrow the money now, and, it, you know, as we've talked about many times, it's unlikely the interest rates are going to be lower than they are now ever. They're, they're only going to go up. So you might get the advantage of borrowing now 
and that's $268,000 that you don't have to borrow next year or the year after at a higher interest rate. So, um, you know, so it's, it's all of your choice, um, and, and we have to make a decision pretty soon here. But I think that, um, you know, there's, well, I've said it many times. You know, there's, there's people that are going to be here and paying taxes in 2020. <coughs> and for a variety of reasons, will never be here again. They're either going to move away or they're going to pass away. And do they want to pay five or eight cents more in taxes this year and then leave town when you're financing things that are going to be used for the next 15 years. So but isn't that always the case? I mean... Not if you finance it over time to pay for things. You, you pay for what you use. If you, fi if, you, if you build a bridge and it has a 30-year life and you borrow a million dollars over 30 years and you're here five years, you pay principal and interest based on your property value for five years and you leave and you don't use that bridge anymore. So um, that's, that's, from a public finance perspective, that's the best way to, to, to apportion costs. You gotta factor in though that it costs a little bit more for the person who's lived here all 20 years to do it that way because they pay interest as opposed to paying it all up front. But if they pay it all up front, then they have less money in their pocket now that they could have earned interest on for the next 20 years. So, but unfortunately, the the downside to all of this, and there's no getting away from it. A similar scenario was when we voted voted to uh, bond for this building. We had two options: a 20, 20 year or 30 year, and the board made the decision to go with 20 year. Bill suggested we go for 30 years, uh, but the reason the board went with 20 years, was our concern was that at the end of 20 years, they're, like any inf infrastructure issue, you start to have to put money into the, so you're really not, you're, you're saving yourself right. something, but you're not, you know, it's unfortunately, it, the, things deteriorate even on bridge projects, right. same type of scenario before the bridge is replaced the next time you've already had to put money into right. temporary and fixes and, and whatnot. And that's why on this scenario, I didn't push the envelope. I didn't borrow 950000 right. We borrowed 902000 And we didn't pay it off the fire trucks over 20 years. It's on a 15-year schedule now just for those reasons. So yep. Yep. I've tried to take into consideration the philosophy that you have, and it's it's... You know, you can't argue with it. It's reasonable. We know that there's going to be maintenance and repairs, and, you know, you can finance something over, you know, there's, there's people that, you know, go out and get 40-year mortgages, and, you know, they're having to, you know, pay a quarter of their property value in repairs before they get to their 40 years. So, you know, I understand what you're saying, and I've tried to reflect that in, in these numbers, and kind of split the, the difference and have, you know, so two cent, three cent tax rate and some borrowing is kind of where, where I came down. I, I think and, and I'll, I support I'll, that. I think yeah, that the five, I can see five that the cent board's, increase is, is the largest wall. Yeah, it's aggressive to to, for sure. To take to the yeah. voters. Yeah. I'd like to thank you for this uh, illustration. This is very helpful. Um, but I think I'm leaning I think I'm leaning towards somewhere around a four. I, Less borrowing? I, you know, I think it shows, I think it shows fiscal responsibility to have a hybrid approach of, um, you know, using the, using the easy out, which is raising the tax rate, which, you know, hey, I'm a taxpayer too. I don't want to do that either. But, um, also showing that we are leveraging what we have, you know, and doing some borrowing and doing some asking. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I think it shows fiscal responsibility on our part, and um, I think I think four is probably the where I'm leaning. Four cents. Yeah. And what's the borrow number? I was thinking if we did four cents, we did like two hundred and fifty thousand in borrowing, which is a little less than I think the three cent, three ninety three. It's a round round number. Three ninety three minus seventy seven. Mm. Oh, never mind. That's quite a bit more less. Seventy seven thousand. So basically, you're losing a point. I guess you could do three hundred thousand. Four cents and three hundred thousand. I guess the one thing that I'm anticipating potentially from taxpayers is during town meeting. You know, a lot of times they're single things, Perry Hill, building this, and it's like, and this is a this is a pot of stuff for three hundred thousand. I could see there could be some just discussion around that of wanting. I don't know. It's just a different way to present. I don't know if we've done that before. We've taken debt for a handful of projects and presented it as one. So it might not be that foreign. I just. Since I've been on the board, it typically tends to be like a thing, a thing, a thing, right. a fire truck. A, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be in support of four cents, 300. I think um, to Chris's point, I think, and, and I think the point that more than one of you have made is that um, at some point we have to be responsible and make sure we're collecting enough on a yearly basis to cover what we're spending. I think additionally we have to consider debt as a useful tool to spread out large expenses and I think we, we're doing that. Um, so I would support four cents and a $300,000 borrow is kind of what I think I would support which is basically the three cents, 400, it's just raising it up one more cent. Which means next year we would be, hopefully have that built into the budget so uh, um, knowingly asking a question, I'm, and I know it can complicate things a little bit. Um, the law allows you, when you set the amount of taxes that you're gonna raise, the law allows you to either set a dollar amount or a tax rate. So when you're saying three cents right now, what I'm, going to do unless you say otherwise is multiply three cents by the grand list with a 1% increase on it. So that is the $7,600,000 grand list. And that will raise four cents times that will raise whatever amount that it raises. Um, and then we'll get that authority at town meeting for that dollar amount and then in July, when we set the tax rate, if the tax, if the grant list goes up a half a percent instead of 1%, it becomes 4.2 cents. Right. Or if it goes up 1.3% cent per, uh, as opposed to 1%, then the tax rate is, you know, uh, 3.87 cents to get to the same number. One year after the flood, we actually told the, the uh, asked the, the voters to set the tax rate that they wanted as opposed to a dollar amount. And um, because we were fearful the grand list um, was, yeah, would, be, yeah. would be too, it, it was too uh, volatile uh, in terms of we're going to end up. So, we set that number and said, if we're lucky, it will generate more than we need this year. Uh, and that way we'll, you know, kind of build up our reserves. We don't have to decide that now, but I just want you to know, I'm gonna translate your four cents into a dollar amount. And then when we get to the town meeting, we can decide whether we wanna say four cents or if we wanna say $300,000. Uh, so. Okay. Maybe I'm a dissenter, but I still like the three cent and borrowing 393. Uh, I just believe in 
we're seeing higher and higher taxes, and that's all I hear is people talking about higher and higher <coughs> taxes. And I, would, I don't think it's a bad thing to borrow. Um, I know some of you may, but it's just, I don't. I don't think it's going to hurt our town by borrowing that that kind of money. I think is a smart thing to do to keep the tax rate down a little bit. Well, I can tell you from my eight years of being on the board uh, and watching what's happened in the town, being involved in a large part of the major changes since Irene, uh, and knowing, having a pretty good grasp on what we're faced with here in the next few years, we're gonna be up to our neck in borrowing here uh, in the short, you know, in the not too distant future. So I guess that's you know, the reason I'm trying to put that off as much as possible uh, at this point, because I know it, it's inevitable. Uh, we'll be back here at the table next year, possibly looking at having to borrow again in, in subsequent years after that, you know, well, if you have a good fiscal year, you could pay down an accelerated rate and eliminate some of that debt. That's, I, I would support the four four percent, but I I rather be at three. So we got two at four, I think. One at three, and then <laughs> and then the the, the responsibility falls on you, Jane. I think it's important to to mention the borrowing number along with the the cent. You know, As I, you decide. I think if you. Um, What's the borrowing number? Um, well, I guess the three cent was three, three ninety three two hundred, and the four cent was three hundred. Right. So you're looking to borrow an additional ninety three thousand, basically, for however many years. It doesn't make sense to me, but. What was the three percent, three cent number? Three cents and three ninety three, and four cents and three hundred. It's just like a lot of people nowadays. You know, I'm old school. I don't believe in borrowing for a car for f more than like four years. But people are borrowing today eight years on a on a, on a automobile. You ought to help them. I know it's not good practice, but I don't think, in terms of the amount of our budget that I'm not 92,000 is not pocket change, but it's. And I, w I would hope that within whatever we borrow, like Bill said, he can look and see how much we can borrow from ourselves there. So the interest is going back into exactly. our. Exactly. That's, that's where I'm looking. Yeah, I, I like that. 92 is gonna I like that scenario. Eat, eaten up by borrowing from ourselves. So it's really not hurting us. Well, I'm a little optimistic too, that our grand list will be Pretty decent this year, based on what I've seen going on here and in this last year, and, and even now here in the village. I think I think we'll see a, a substantial uptick. So I'm hoping that that can, if we set a four cent tax rate and borrow the 300, uh, I'm optimistic to see that knock that four cents knock back. Uh, it's, it's a gamble. Are you saying that sustainable growth of Grand List is a good thing and maybe? <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a slower death, that's all. It's just a slower death. Gotta build some more, more projects. I'm giving you some time, Jane. And, uh... All right, I can support um, the 4% four percent, four cent increase. Okay. With the borrowing around 300000 All right, I think like, the plane has landed. You know, I'm going to say one thing that we talked about a long time ago that the board might consider in the future um, is I know we'd have to change our charter, but the idea of a local options tax, I believe it's called. You know, I just think, you know, we have, we have a lot of needs, and as you say, the borrowing's not going to go away. Um, I think it's good that we're stepping up on pavement underfunded for a number of years. So um, 
We got police needs, that's an expense, and we're lucky to have the deal that we have with the state police, but that's a, that's a big chunk of change. And I, I don't know, it seems like it might be worth investigating or getting the charter changed so that when and if you want to do that, you'd be ready to do it. I'm not saying it's just an option. It's like a town like Waterbury that is a crossroads for so many people, has and so I many think visitors. I it might be something to explore. We, you know, we've had a little bit of that discussion in the past, Jane, and I agree that a you know, conversation uh, might, be, might be justifiable. Uh, as, as I'd said before, you know, if I'm still on the board, I'd like to see the major players in that conversation being the business owners come to the table uh, because that's who basically is going to impact the most and without their blessing it'd be tough to uh, to try to implement something like that but I, I but I think that you know right now uh, in the next couple of years we're trying to wall our way through this reconstruction project and we need to let the dust settle on that first and and see who pops out of the dust uh, Right. It's, business is going. And it's tough. I mean, I, I know that uh, more and more towns are going down that route. Um, in a sense, it's, you know, it's lowering one tax by raising another. Um, and yes, maybe some more people who don't live here pay the tax, and you can argue whether they know about it or not. I mean, um, you know, I, I shop and go to restaurants in towns that have local option taxes. And I don't make a decision whether I'm gonna to go to Stowe or Williston based on that. I just go where I feel like going and the bill comes and you, you pay it. But um, it is a little bit challenging when you know, you're know you out there with your economic development people and you're recruiting people like darn tough t socks to come into town and, and then you're gonna slap a 1% tax on their sales maybe. And, you know, that's, that's a challenge. And whether it would apply there or not, because it, it's wholesale, but I know that, you know, when we did the calculation back in 2011, be careful what you ask for, because we did a whole study on, on, uh, on the local option tax, and we were just about ready to make some decision about whether we we're gonna go forward or not, and, and then you know there was eight feet of water on Main Street, <laughs> so we we didn't we didn't right. do it. Well, it just seems like it might be something well, out there in the future. And, right. and you know, so anyway, it's it's. I it's, agree. It's, let the, it's let, an interesting comment. And let the dust settle for the Main Street project because I know that's taken it. It's not easy for some of the merchants on Main Street. So. Yeah, and a quick comment that I've made before. I think if you're going to present that to business owners, present it as paying for things that maybe are already in the budget that maybe help support their their businesses. And yes, police are, but I, I think you have to be careful of saying paying for municipal services through collecting you know, taxes from someone like my customers. It's a little harder to sell. I think it, if you look throughout the budget, I'm sure you could find things that would be maybe a little bit more... Um, approachable to warrant maybe that conversation with the business owners and get their support. Turning out the lights. <laughs> I think that's a cue. So <laughs> we're not do done you, yet. Are you looking for a motion? Yeah, there needs to be a motion. And um, I think what what motion you could do is uh, well. Before we make a, a final motion, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the general operating budget for a minute. Um, and I contemplated going into executive session to talk about this, but it's only the TV that's here, and you know it's nothing that I'm trying to hide. No, no, no. You don't have to turn it off. Because uh, unless there's technical difficulties in it, but no, turning it off is not a good idea. Um, I, I raised this issue back last spring, and I'm going to bring it up again now. Um, in, the, in the budget, um, in the general fund, I have municipal car, and I got $4,200 proposed there, and then there's vehicle maintenance at $1,500, and then there's gas at $660. 
dollars. Um, and so that's what, 52, 57, uh, about $6,000. And, and frankly, that won't do it. So the, the car that I drive now, 2009 Toyota Camry uh, hybrid, and um, I never got around to, you know, taking up Mark's idea was, well, you know, let's just lease a vehicle for the next three years. You might retire by that time, and then the next town manager won't have a car and, uh, to deal with, and, and you get to negotiate with whoever that person is for the full uh, compensation package. I think um, I said eight-year lease. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so, so um, a couple things have happened since then. One, we've continued to put a little bit of money into the car. Two, we had Kathleen Day and Duncan McDougall and others come in and talk about this, uh, you know, do everything possible to make sure that you address climate change issues. And three, um, the, the car that I'm driving now can't be inspected. Um, our own highway mechanic would not inspect it because the frame is rusted out. Um, it's only 10 years old, so this speaks to Chris's salt issue, right? So uh, it's got about 85,000 miles on it. Everything else about the car is great, except the undercarriage is, is just uh, irreplaceable or irreparable uh, without spending a lot of money. I thought that I went to a local mechanic, not the town mechanic, and I said, you know, uh, we're a little busy right now. Um, can you inspect the car? And I didn't say anything about the issues. And when I went back the other afternoon to pick it up, I saw the old sticker was still on there. And I said, must be a problem. And he said, yeah. He said, I'm not putting an inspection sticker <laughs> on there. So we need a new vehicle. So taking a cue from the climate change folks, I did a little research. Because the day after they were here, um, get you a bicycle. The day after they were here, that tires. Uh, Duncan. I know I liked you for a reason. The day after they were here, Duncan McDougall sent me a, a link and said, "Here are the hybrid electric and plug-in electric cars that you can buy." And I didn't necessarily have the conversation with them about. I don't want it to say the town will do everything it can do because I was thinking about the dump truck that was a, you know, a plug-in dump oh, truck that was going to cost a half a million dollars. <laughs> but my, my thinking is that people will probably push towards getting something uh, along those lines. The, the Camry that I have now is a hybrid, but it's not a plug-in. So I've looked, you know, not going to present a BMW even though that's one that has a very high rating. But, you know, the Toyota Prius, the, the Camry does have a, a, still does have a hybrid. I don't think it's a plug-in. I think it's the same kind that I have now, Subaru Crosstrek Kia Optima. So for, they range in prices from uh, 27550 for the Toyota Prius, to 35,200 or 34,900 for the Subaru Crosstrek. The Crosstrek doesn't offer a lease, so if you take $35,000 and divide that, or 30, yeah, 35 divided by five years, uh, it's $7,000 a year plus maintenance and gas and all that. Um, the ones that you can lease, they're requiring a minimum, the lowest one, was a $2,500 um, down payment and uh, $290 a month. So in the first year alone, that's about $6,000, and then you've got the gas and stuff on top of that. What I would propose and what I would prefer, frankly, is if you would adjust my 
pay. Give me $7,000, $7,500 more and get out of, and you know, it's, you, you change a couple lines. We don't have to buy any more gas. We don't have to do any more vehicle maintenance. We don't have to have uh, either a car payment or a lease payment or, a, or you know, go out and borrow $35,000. Pay me $7,500 a year uh, and let me take care of my own car. And what I would suggest to you is while it would be all salary, what I would do going forward is divide my salary in such that the salary that I'm making now is my base and whatever inflationary increases or performance increases that you would give in the future would be applied to the base and the $7,000 would just stay $7,000 or $7,500. Uh, and you wouldn't add the inflation to that base going forward. So my proposal is to, to change the budget a little bit. It doesn't affect the amount of money that's in the budget this year. It's just that you pay it to me versus um, paying a lease. So you wouldn't have a reimbursement for like monitoring <laughs> or anything like that? You know, it's one of the reasons, Mike, that I really feel that the town manager here in Waterbury doesn't really need a vehicle anymore. When I first came here, I spent a lot of time going out on the road, checking with Bubby Wilder, Howard Ripley, the water plant, the sewer plant. Um, mostly now, I drive it from home to here and then home again. Commuting. So it's, it's commuting, which, you know, um, I pay taxes on the value of my personal use of the car, and it's, it's mostly personal use now. Um, any of the in-town stuff that I do, I wouldn't charge, you know, if, if I had my own car and I had to drive up to Greg Hill to look at a project or to the water plant or to the sewer plant, I wouldn't charge mileage for, for that. Okay. If I have to go to a meeting oh, White River, that's what I'm saying. White River Junction, you know, I might ask for the 55 cents a mile, but those, okay. those are a few times a year, basically. So for me, I think it, on a personal level, it makes it easier for me in terms of record keeping and everything else. Um, and it really isn't going to change anything as far as the budget is concerned. Is that an okay? <laughs> I don't really have a problem. I, you know, I, I, I like the idea. It gives us some flexibility, you know, when you do retire, you know, that we'd have the option to do something else with the new town, town manager, you know, depending upon what he wanted to do in his compensation. Yeah, I told Chris this morning, I said, you know, the reason I have a car is because when I came here, you know, we talked about salary and benefits and everything else, and then Ed Steele said, oh, by the way, we have a car for you, too, that you can use for your personal use. So, you know, that's right. okay. It's there. I it's said, great. said, okay, great, I'll take it. But um, but if it hadn't been offered, if you it, probably if wouldn't. It, if, it, if, it, if, if you didn't have it, I wouldn't have, right. you know, I was getting, uh, in my previous job, I was getting a, an allowance of, you know, whatever, $30 a month or something like that for a car. But... But now it's been part of my compensation package for 32 years, so I'm not just going to give it up, you know. Right. But maybe the next time, the next town manager may we just just do away with this altogether, you know, just try. Well, that's what this is setting us that up this, for. That this does that. This I just converts. Would be reasonable. Right. And if this somebody drives a, to White River Junction, they would charge mileage and right. be done. With it. But the only thing. He, Whoever the next town manager is going to be is going to look at that seventy-five hundred dollar line item. I'm sure he's going to see that. And what seventy-five? It's a one-time deal. No, it's not. It's just going to be. No, a, just say his my compensation. Salary. It's yeah. going to be no, my. Well, it's not right. a one-time. It's a yearly deal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that but, person's going to look at. Your salary being X number of dollars with that seventy-five. But they would, they would I think look we're at, a deal. They would look at <laughs> my salary and oh, by the way, he's getting a car. Right? I mean, I, you know, it's it's. Well, just explain that that deal is done the next time. 
Well, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. not a benefit we would have to offer. Right. And, and you're going to negotiate with whomever it is next, whenever it is, and you're going to negotiate, and you're going to pay whatever you end up right. negotiating. Right, pay what the going rate is. You know, you might pay him $40,000 more than you pay him me. Didn't, on a similar note, didn't the state restructure their pension plans with, with new people coming on board, or is it still... They did a bunch of years ago, but I don't think recently. So I heard you need a motion. Is that what? So I think that you can you can make a motion to to you know to change my compensation by replacing the car benefit with pay, and you choose the number. I mean the the. The car that I have now, the uh, with the down payment and the uh, and the monthly payment, would be seven thousand four hundred forty-six dollars in the first year, and then the second year, you know, would be lower than that. So, seven thousand, I think, is a reasonable number. Because we also pay insurance. Yeah. Gas. Yeah, you pay gas insurance, all the maintenance, tires, um, brakes, oil change. Yeah, I mean, I think we knew for a while that that car was going to go. Anyways, I think this is this is a smart move, um, and I think it's a fair move. Um, I would be in support of the seven thousand dollars a year increase to Bill's compensation and removing the car as his as a benefit for him and adjust the P and L accordingly. Is that your motion? I make that like a it. motion. I'll make a motion to do that. I second that motion. What's that? Adjust the P&L, what's that? A uh, profit and loss statement to not oh. have it in the automobile, but put it in the, your compensation instead. Okay, the budget, okay. The budget, <laughs> sorry, we're going to be Based upon Duncan and um, Miss Day's thing, you're probably going to have to buy an electric car. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, I have a, um, okay, did we second it? No, yeah, I hadn't heard a second yet. Okay, there you go. Um, I, I've been shopping for a car, and they have a rebate um, through Toyota and efficiency Vermont on the Prius Prime, which gets the first 25 miles free, or electric, it's not free. Um, they've increased that, so it's, it's a hybrid, but the first 25 miles. So you might look into that, because the rebate ends next week. Oh, okay. It's a $3,000 rebate. All right. So motion's been made and seconded to remove the vehicle option from the manager's compensation package and replace it with a $7,000 additional increase in his salary. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 I think now we should it's buy a Chevy Silverado. <laughs> okay. So, so now that that's taken care of, um, I think what your motion should be now is that you direct the manager to um, adjust the capital budgets because I'll make that one change in terms of the municipal vehicle in the general budgets. You've already, you know, the library budget, we talked about the highway budget last week. I did, you know, there was a little bit of posting of expenses and a little bit of revenue posting that came in between last Monday and, and, and uh, this weekend. I did go into the highway budget and the general fund budget and pared that down a little bit because the the expenses that came in in the last week would have made the tax rate be a little higher than 51 cents. So I still have the three operating budgets at 51 cents, and there won't be any postbacks now. So your motion now should be to direct me to uh, make changes to the operating budgets uh, and the CIP budgets 
to maintain a 51 cent tax rate, adding four cents and borrowing $300,000. Uh, so if somebody wants to make that, Carol and I can you fix the motion the tomorrow. So moved. Mike did that? He did. You're going to have to help me with that tomorrow? Yeah. My mic's out of juice here, so Mike made the motion. I second. That seconds it. Uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing none from the board, all those who wish to approve, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Good. Big sigh of relief. <laughs> thank you. For well, thank you all for your work. Yeah. Yeah, let's hope the taxpayers. It's on the warning sign. You gotta adjust it though. Oh, I need the first page. I can just put this one's dead too, Ann. Okay, you can just have yeah, it sign it up. All right, that's good. Stays on for a couple seconds. Okay, we're not quite done. <coughs> Chris? Don't, don't move just yet. No, no I'm not going anywhere. I haven't motioned to adjourn yet. We need, a, we need a motion to approve the warning. Oh. Hello, hello, hello. Sorry. That's okay. It's just us here, so we all know who we are. Yeah, I'm dead too. I'm on red. We're all on red here, yeah. Here I go. Who wants to use that? So I'm sorry, we need a motion to approve town meeting morning. The town meeting morning. Uh, for the meeting on Tuesday, March 3rd. For the meeting on Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020. So Carla had sent that out yes, uh, earlier exactly. today. So this is what you Does need to sign. See yeah, I was going to say, I, I apparently didn't get to my computer in time to see it. So the only thing we're going to do is switch around articles 7 and 8. So we do the CIP and the borrowing first, and then the budget after that. That makes sense. I don't think I got it. I got another copy. So a motion to approve the warning with the subsequent changes of switching seven and eight around. So moved. Okay. okay. That's a pretty, um, is there a straightforward, there's, there's nothing controversial. Last year we had, um, you know, shall we authorize 30 whatever thousand for WASI and we had the tax stabilization fund formula, uh, we took those out. There's no reason for those to be on there. So it's a pretty straightforward warning. There's article no controversial 11. issues. Article 11 is the climate change article and article. It, is it appropriate to add on the special, I know I've talked about this, on the special um, articles to require that the people requesting money have a designated rep it doesn't have to be a staff member but a designated uh, person at the meeting to so their before we go any further can I get a second on the motion please who made who made the motion Mike did just need a second and then, I we second. Can, then we can talk about it okay. okay thanks so do you know what his question was yeah it's um, Really it just revises thing. that set it, it kind of just adds a little thing for future you, you know it's not for this town meeting but for future town meetings that at least someone's there who could talk you know because sometimes people they say oh yeah they do good work and stuff like that you know have, most of the groups can do that if, if they're asked Pleasure on that. Board members feel that's a good thing, a bad thing? I think 
think I like having someone there that can answer in case anyone wonders what it is. My question is, is it like some of these lower dollar ones, like the hundreds, the two fifties? You know, it'd be a little harder to. F I don't know. Maybe it's not, but. Yeah, I think our, our original purpose for combining them all, and I'm just giving you a little background, it was to <coughs> cut back on the length of time, I think, yeah, that... Yeah. Uh, Did they take the signature page? Yeah, it's uh, over there, in, somewhere. I guess I would ask, rather than the board making that decision, is it worth asking the voters, and can we ask the voters? Yeah, it's, you, you can. It's tough to do. Um, you know, you've aggregated a bunch of them, so you read the motion once and, you know, ten of them get approved. The, you know, I had an interesting conversation with Chuck Kleteka a couple of uh, months ago because the uh, Greeter Grant, so it's a $8,000 project, and they're going to get a grant, they hope, of $2,500, so they got to come up they do fundraising for the rest of it. So he originally told Carla that they were going to come in and try to get an appropriation from the town. And I kind of gave him a hard time about it. That's not the one. Oh. That's not the signature page. Oh. That is. We, that was a practice. <laughs> I'm sorry, Bill. I, um, I kind of gave him a hard time about it. And then, you know, uh, several weeks ago, I saw him and he said, ah, it's just too much work to try to get the signatures. So uh, they didn't do it. And I said, you know, I, I get frustrated because we do have one new asker this year. There's somebody else asking for what, $2,500? The maker space, you know, the place over on Bidwell Lane that um, uh, it's an art place and now they're asking for $2,500 from the from the town to support that. Um, and I don't think you can do it this year, but I think a better way to do it would be to have the select board and maybe a committee decide how much are we willing to give away. And if it's $50,000 or $75,000, and then appoint a committee and have people ask that committee and make their case. And we've kind of said, mm, this is how much money we have. Now, you can't prevent people from getting petitions. They can override it, but it might be a better way to, to do that in the future is to get people, if somebody gets up at town meeting and just because they're a representative, you don't even know what questions to ask them. You know, if you, if you, if you had a set budget and then people had to come in and, and ask and make a case for it that they should get the money. So. That's see, see my question, a time. suggesting like kind of like a variant process in a sense, but more or less. See, my question was more: you get these groups, and I know we have that big pecking order, and then someone looks at their town report, and no one's there from that knows right. boo about, except someone like you know David Luce will go and say, "Oh yeah, they're a great organization," blah blah blah, you know. It'd be nice to have someone who knows something about the organization and can ask an intelligent yeah. question. That's, that's where I'm going. But if the public really felt that strongly about it, they would say no when David Luce or Alex Cauley gets up and they, they never feels do. he has to make a motion for every single one that's there. Speaking of that, I want full disclosure here. Um, on the revenue page of the budget, and I don't know if you all have it with you or not. There's a line item, it says, it's up in the, under other governments, and it's highlighted, pilot not-for-profits, and there was $1,850 budgeted last year, and there was $2,002.26 that came in. You see that line that I'm looking yeah. at? Everybody got it? And there's zero proposed this year. So that's the ice center. And I, I, I just thought of it now because we're thinking about these special articles. You're talking and about that ice center. The ice center down there. Okay. So when they built the building and the, the village got involved in water and sewer allocations and this and that and the town, you know, uh, worked and so on and so forth, 
the select board and the village trustees entered an agreement with them, signed a contract and said, basically, if you're considered tax exempt, you're still going to pay the local uh, tax, the municipal tax. And they went back and forth, and there were some years that they were exempt from the education tax, some years that they weren't exempt from anything. <coughs> now the legislature has exempted them <coughs> from taxation altogether. But because they have this 25-year-old contract or whatever, however many years they've been there now with us, they paid us $2,000 last year. It's based on the value of the property times the 51 cent tax rate is $2,000. Um, and I'm looking at these, all these organizations that are asking for special articles and this maker space now is asking for $2,500 and these doesn't organizations happen. out of Montpelier and all these different places and we're giving them money and I think that in terms of local business the ice center brings a lot of business into this community and I think that maybe it's time from my perspective that rather than go out of our way to to bill them a couple thousand dollars to just instead of having them come and ask for a you know because this happened with the with the Grange before they went out of the business. Mm -hmm. The Grange s s came to us and said, uh, we'd like to yeah, ask for money. You know, they wanted a tax exemption. And I said, you know, that's a really difficult process to go through to get a tax exemption. Why don't you just ask a special article that will cover your tax payment? Yeah. But for me, I think the community gets a lot more out of the ICE Center than we get out of going out of our way to make a special tax bill for them since they're a tax-exempt organization. They don't really cost us anything. Yeah, we plow the road. That's really what we do down there. So, And the road is used for a lot more than just the ICE Center. We, we've got all kinds of construction material down there <laughs> that we need to go get. So, Are we still... Uh and you said plow the road. Are we still responsible for paving it and all that as well? Well, it is. It is our road, and it's paved. Um, I guess that was when we did the when we when Woody and Alec and I talked about the paving, uh, you know, analysis. Mm -hmm. I asked the question. You know, maybe when that road is so out of shape and it needs something done, maybe we should do with that what we did with Little River Road, just grind it up and make it gravel again. Um, doesn't have to be paved. The only reason it's paved is because one year Bubby came to the select board and said, you know, the only reason I got to bring a grader down here into the village is to pave that road. I mean, to grade that road. That one road. Um, but asphalt costs a lot more than it did back then. So my feeling is we would just when the time comes, just grind it out and put stay mad on it and be done with it. Sounds good to me. So if you're okay with not charging them the payment in lieu of taxes, you don't have to do anything because the budget that you've approved a minute right. ago right. Had, had that, that in, in there. But yeah. I, I don't want to just kind of slide it by without nope. telling you it, what my thinking was. And it's not us that... Probably you're not sliding it by us because I saw it there prior to this meeting anyway, but um, it may be picked up by a voter and who knows what conversation will ensue after that. So you can, we can certainly leave it the way it is and uh, see what happens. Let, let the voters deal with it. Yep. You also had kind of a blank on that parking. Yeah, I highlighted that a couple right. weeks ago just to say that's something that some people are asking for. But given where we are right now, yeah, it's like and what you told me last <laughs> week. I yeah, thought, I said, let all the people who complain about it volunteer. Yeah. Yeah. So with that being there said, are, there are, there are we all set, Bill? You have your signature page back, Carla? I do. Okay, yeah, we're all done. Okay. Oh, Who wants to be the us. first to motion to adjourn? I just want to say that I want to thank you, Phil, for your comments on the front porch forum addressing 
oh. issues or concerns that people make. I appreciate that you take the time to write detailed, thoughtful responses. And off, off the top of your head, you, you go through in a logical way to explain the issues, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Second that, I sometimes want to get on, but I say <laughs> I'm just going to get myself in trouble. I try as best I can to stay off, but every once in a while there's sometimes something on there. It's just like, <laughs> no, I got to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, pull me back in. So did I get a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all for your time and work. I've never. Thank you.